If I can get everyone's attention, please. We're going to get started in a second. Uh, the buzz is a really good sign. Uh, we've got a, um, a chief transformation officer. His name is Randy Nesbitt. And one of the concepts that Randy introduced to us is when you put teams together, the concepts of forming, storming, norming, and then getting to performing. So we formed you. There's a little storming that goes on. Uh, you've got to figure each other out. You've got to have the body language. You have to know where people are coming from. You have to re really appreciate uh, their expertise that they bring to the mix, be able to deal with the dissonance, and then you can start performing after that once you get settled in. Uh, I see already that the contacts are being made, and that, that's outstanding. I'm Brian Francis. I'm the Executive Director with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, and I want to welcome you to this uh, training summit. So this morning is all about you being students. You think you know a lot about our agency. You're going to learn how we do business, who we are, uh, the services that we'll provide to the boards, what you can anticipate during a board meeting, and the role you're going to play. Whether you like it or not, I know some of the folks are, Brad is, um, you are now a state employee, and you get all the salaries that come with it. We're paying you zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> but you are taking on a public service role. So whether you come from the private sector, whether you work for Bucky's, uh, you are taking on a public service role, and that means that the hat that you wear here is bigger than the one you wear normally. You're not just sitting in that seat as West Nance. You're sitting in that seat as a Texan who's going to help shape policy for the state of Texas. If you didn't know it, that's a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big deal. Dealing with the motorcycle safety, you guys have had your task force that have met for years, but now you're going to help us set the standards going forward for safety on the road. Not just for you, Jude, not just for you but for all the Texans, everybody who's going to get on a motorcycle in the next year and a half is going to be influenced by what you do, how you do it, how you set it. That's a huge responsibility. It's something that our agency, and you can see from the attendance of my staff here, it's something that we take very seriously. And I appreciate you stepping up to the table to take this on as well. <clears throat> we are not experts in your area. We're, we're not experts in motorcycle safety. We're not experts in fuel distributors. We are experts in moving paper through the process well, in being able to resolve complaints fairly for Texans. We're experts in licensing individuals. When we bring our expertise together and yours, that's going to serve Texans great. So the whole thing is when you come in that door, it's, it's time to work for Texas. You're off the clock for your, your, your employer, and you're on the clock for Texans. You're on the clock for my mother. Little Charles Edda Francis, five foot one inches on a good day if she's standing on a stool. You're on, you're on the clock for her. You're making sure that when she's on the road, it's safe. When she's getting her fuel, it's safe. That's how I approach the job. I work for my mom. I don't work for you. I work for her. I want to make things work well for her. Uh, we've got a foreigner in our midst. Mr. Webster down there is a non-Texan, but he is welcome. He has safe passage. <laughs> Everyone in this room should know he has safe passage. Uh, I'd like to do a quick thing, just go around the room, quick introductions, um, <clears throat> name, organization, and then we'll move it on. Okay. Jason Harris with Buckies. No. Shiraz Ali with Smiley's. Uh, Carlos Garza with Altigre Food Stores, Texas Travel Centers. Adam Thompson with Meter Calibration Solutions. The, micro, the <clears throat> microphones are there for a reason, gentlemen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Wes Nance. I'm with JF Petroleum Group, formerly PSI. I'm Steve Boyd with Suncoast Resources Incorporated. Harry Maxey with Maxey Energy Company out of Uvalde. <clears throat> Gary Garrison, Fred Garrison Oil Company, Plainview, Texas. Uh, Steve Webster, foreigner from uh, the great state of Maine, and I, <laughs> I uh, represent Wax Incorporated. Good to have you here, Steve. I'm Steve Scarlock. I'm with Independent Bankers Association of Texas here in Austin. Adam Colby, Tyler Police Department. Broader muscle with this. Brad Schulke with the Texas Attorney General's Office. Keith Rovell with MRH, rider training out of Houston. Chris Litvin with the Motorcycle Training Center. Uh, Roger Bowles, Better Rider Motorcycle Training in Waco. I'm Kyle McNew with the Texas a and I'm Engineering Extension Service. Rick Wyatt, Harley Davidson of Kingwood. Jude Chuck Snyder, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> you must be from Louisiana. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Jeff Alford, Total Rider here in Austin, Texas. It's great to have all of y'all here. I'm going to turn it over to uh, David Gonzalez. He's our Deputy Executive Director of Licensing Services. And the first part of the agenda is going through our divisions, how they operate, what they do, who they are. And so I'll turn it over to David and his team. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Brian. So it is hard to compete that with the energy that our executive director has, uh, but we are going to try our best. I am, uh, as he said, one of the three deputy executive directors here at this agency. Been here 23 years. I will go through our agenda because our staff worked very hard to put these books together for you. We have a large group here. So if you will turn to item one in y'all's agenda, y'all should see an executive office report. I do not want to read to y'all, but words mean something. Our boss has taught us that the things that he puts down on paper mean something. He's a poet. Uh, it's ingrained in his nature. So it's important that we actually go through some of the things that we put down in print. The executive office provides leadership and motivation. That's who we are as a team in the executive office. I want to make sure and bring to your attention that on our website we have a mission and vision, vision statement that's very important to this agency. I'm going to read the mission and vision because this is something that our executive office spent extra time working on to make sure that everybody knew what our purpose was, to earn the trust of Texans every day by providing innovative regulatory solutions for our licensees and those that they serve, to earn the trust of Texans every day. He wanted those words to ring out. He wants people to go to our website. He wants people to have business with us and know that that is what we strive to do every day. Our vision to be the best at creating next practices that deliver low cost licensing and regulatory services and an exceptional customer service experience. To be the best, Brian Francis is a very competitive man. To be the best, he takes seriously. He expects that from his staff. If we're not giving our 100% every time we're out here, we're falling short. So we are trying our best to give you what you need and to serve the customers of Texas. So the members of executive office, obviously, Mr. Brian Francis, you've met. I don't want him to get too big of a head, but I will <coughs> briefly touch on my boss's um, strengths. He's passionate. He's very inclusive, as evidence to these types of meetings. We do these all the time. We have summits. We put ourselves in front of the public. We invite the dissidents to our meetings because we need to hear how we can improve. All of our meetings are conducted this way with transparency. We do the streaming so we can have the public listen in as well. He is boundless in energy, and it is contagious. He spreads it amongst the agency. He dabbles a little bit here. He dabbles a little bit there. He's finally sharing some of that workload. We've been able to have him as a workhorse with broad shoulders carrying a lot of the work, but he's allowed us to uh, delve into some of the more deeper thoughts in his mind and allowed us to help out. He's very smart. The smartest leaders hire people that are smarter than them. And so I'm actually very proud to introduce some of the other staff that are surrounding me and supporting them. And I think it makes for a good segue uh, for Mike Otis Mendez, who actually used to be the chair of our commission. He's a governor appointee, chair of our commission. He liked us so much, he's moved from the Panhandle to Austin to become another deputy executive director. He preceded me, he was before me as a deputy executive director. And uh, his energy, his enthusiasm, it plays in really well to, to Brian's strength and he's helped out a whole bunch. Uh, he's not here this morning, but he will be here this afternoon uh, to head up the FMQ group. I introduce myself, David Gonzalez. I actually preceded Brian. I've been here 23 years. They decided I was worth keeping. Uh, and we thought the same of uh, Brian when he came along. He's just been uh, uh, amazing to work for. And the investment in his staff, not just myself, but all the staff at this agency are included in these processes. You'll see we have a big crew, uh, group behind us. They're always listening because they know that's Brian's expectations. He gives us training, he gives us development, and he allows us to participate. Even though it may not be our program, we may be on the ancillary side, we may be on administrative staff, he allows for that participation because he knows everybody's input is important. And I've been impressed with that. That's what's kept me here for 23 years. I didn't think I'd be here more than one uh, when I started here in state employment. But, but 23 years later, I'm still here. The next person I want to introduce, Christina Kaiser, is our deputy uh, the other, the third deputy executive director. She used to be the director of enforcement. She's a force to be reckoned with. I can tell you as a peer, I have looked to her as a mentor, as actually a, an icon at this agency. When I was the RPM division director, I got promoted to deputy. I was the RPM division director. I used to introduce our enforcement staff as some of the very nicest people that we never want to introduce you to and you never want to meet. 
they're really nice people, but they get their business done. If you're doing something bad, if you're doing something wrong, if you're violating statutes or rules, her crew, her group actually have been a, uh, done a great job at making sure that you don't do it often or you won't do it again if you get caught that first time. I've been really impressed with Ms. Kaiser, and she runs a tight ship. She's got standard operating procedures. She's got pen penalty matrices. She standardizes the process to where it's a well-oiled machine, and I've been impressed with that ever since she's been here. She actually uh, worked Brian, with Brian at the Real Estate Commission, so she has a history with him as well, and it's really evident in the way they work together and get things done. So that's a little bit about the executive leadership. The true bosses of the agency uh, are the next group. I'm going to go ahead and listen to their names because I don't want to forget any of them. Karen Berryman, Yvonne Campos, Tamela Fletcher, Carnesia Pinson, and Christine Riff. I think y'all already know, executive assistants, they know everything that's going on in the office, and if they gel, if their teamwork is good, then they have us in the right places doing the right things. They have the materials in front of us. We know what we're supposed to be talking about. We know where we're supposed to be. They are the true bosses uh, in our mm -hmm. office. They tell us what we're supposed to know, who we're supposed to be talking to. I'm, um, I'm surprised that they are able to wrangle all the different personalities between Christina Kaiser, Addis Mendez, uh, Mr. Francis and myself, it's a lot to pull together and make sure that the, the work all gets done, but they seem to do it. They're able to take care of the little things like translating Brian's chicken scratch. He goes to these meetings and he's all out here talking and the hands are moving and he writes down chicken scratch notes that nobody can understand except our executive staff. So they put these things together, they give us our notes, they give us our graphs, make sure that we're informed and keep on track on what we're supposed to be doing. So very happy to have that team together. again. Their gelling, their teamwork is what makes our executive office work so well. Next in line is uh, two gentlemen that I'm proud to call friends uh, and definitely lucky to have as co-workers. We work for government, so at the end of the day, it's about the numbers. Everybody needs to see how we're producing, what our budget looks like, all the information that goes with the, uh, the outputs that we have. These two gentlemen are phenomenal at their jobs. I believe Tony is homegrown. I'm not sure if he had state employment before he came here. I know he came from our enforcement division, one of Christina Kaiser's crew, but he started in enforcement and has done a phenomenal job keeping up with our fiscal notes, keeping our teams together whenever we have to have sunset reports done and provide numbers, which we are going under sunset right now. Those are the numbers that are very important. They're reviewing all the things that we've been doing. They're probably going to have exception reports on the things we do. It's important that the no those numbers be right. Hammond Macon, I was actually fortunate enough to meet at a governor's executive development program before we even took over the podiatry program. We were fortunate to steal Hammond from podiatry. He was executive director over there. He was uh, gracious enough to come work for us and has been a great addition to our team. He has the right personality and all the right skill sets. Just a phenomenal amount of wealth and, and executive leadership that uh, really contributes to the team. Then lastly, we have Brian Kelly, who is our facilities project manager. There's a lot of growth at this agency. With two new programs, you can expect we've got more staff coming on, a lot of musical chairs, people moving around with promotions and, and moving to different places with their knowledge. Doc is really helping with space planning and with the construction planning and with facilities management and anything else that we have on a list, it, Doc can do it, he takes care of it. I'm just amazed and I'm referring to him as Doc because we had to go to his short names. We have a lot of acronyms at this agency. His name is Brian Kelly. Uh, he's the other Brian but uh, we refer to him as Doc. He takes care of the business for our agency. So that's my part. I think I kept it within time limits. We're gonna try to keep on track today. I'd like to introduce uh, this. Gina would be next and coming up. And Kenny, Gina Riordan and Kenny Wright. And I'm gonna move from the table so they can have the microphone so they can introduce our Office of Project and Transformation Management. Thank you for your time. Uh, good morning. My name is Kenny Wright. I am the project portfolio manager for the agency. In my role, my responsibility primarily is focused on ensuring that we successfully complete all projects that are assigned to my team. Uh, my team is composed of five project managers and one uh, management analyst. Uh, on my team, I have uh, Teresa Alvarez, who <laughs> handles primarily our workflow process projects. She is also uh, a key <coughs> player in our IT-related projects. Also on my team, I have uh, Eric Davis, who has been tasked with a very complicated and difficult project for our agency, and that is the management of our forms and trying to find a way to have a central repository for our forms 
creating a numbering system for our forms, um, as well as having standardization within our forms. Um, also on my team is Odie Martinez, and right now she is working on one of our most important projects, and that is the development of our uh, fuel metering and quality system that we will be using to manage the licenses. And that is a, a significant project that has several different components to it. Um, also on my team, there is Mark Sue Owen, and she is primarily an IT project manager. She handles mostly our server-related projects, our system solution projects. And then lastly, on my team right now is Julianne Crocker. She is our management analyst, and her focus area is around feasibility studies and gap analysis. Uh, again, the main goal for the project management office is to successfully manage all of our projects um, and to be communicative with our stakeholders and with our constituents. Great, you, Kenny. Good morning. My name is Gina, and uh, I am representing the Office of Transformation, which is the sister, uh, sister uh, team to project management with Kenny's group. So Office of Transformation is primarily concerned with solving complicated business issues. Um, we practice in three domain areas. There's transformation, and that's about uh, uh, basically how can we assist our divisions to uh, expand their capacity and prepare for the future. Uh, what, is, what is TDLR gonna look like in 2030? So uh, there's transformation, <coughs> excuse me, we also use scenario planning. I don't know if anyone is familiar with that, but it is a particular domain that is about making presumptions about what the future is gonna be like, how our business environment is gonna change when I speak of 2030. What's, are we gonna be in flying cars by then? You know, what's, what's that future gonna look like? And how will those different realities impact TDLR? Uh, and then finally, um, data-driven decisions. You know, we constantly look uh, to our sister group and to IT and outside our agency for uh, uh, data to support the things that, that guide us. Um, our team briefly is, uh, we're uh, missing Randy Nesbitt. Brian Francis mentioned him at the beginning. Uh, he is our chief transformation officer and he leads our team with a, a well-oiled uh, uh, engine and a, a tactical course. I work with uh, George Bomar. He holds the charge of that scenario planning um, uh, hat that we spoke about. And he also monitors organizational trends. Myself, Gina, I'm a certified black belt. Um, and I ensure that our critical processes are reviewed and optimized. Um, I work with Deborah Chapaluna. She's not here today, but she truly is our voice of the customer. She lends her firsthand experience to assist us in making data-driven decisions as well. Um, so what we do, some, some of the uh, bullets in front of you, there's quite a few in there, but creating projects that support our agency staff. Obviously, transformation is, is the biggest part of that. Capturing the voice of the customer. Um, we work on various surveys for internal and external um, uh, customers. Uh, one of the biggest one is uh, the University of Texas has a uh, employee engagement uh, survey and we help them out with that. And of course collaborating with Randy who is our chief transformation officer to just stay in alignment with what uh, Brian's vision is for the agency and how we move forward into the future. So that's it. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tila Mange. I'm the Public Information Officer for the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. So I deal primarily with the news media, and I'm in charge of our social media presence. So if you aren't already following us on Twitter and on Facebook, please. Oh. Oh. Um. <laughs> Um, please do follow us. Uh, we put a lot of important information and some fun things on, on our social media channels. There are four pieces of the Office of Strategic Communication, of which one is, is communications. Um, we're responsible for all the contacts with the news media, external and internal communications. We have a, a weekly newsletter that goes out to all employees across the state so that we can keep everybody informed on what's going on around the, the agency. 
We also do the promotional materials, um, design, and any agency public facing communication. So any reports that go to the legislature come through our office um, and we make them pretty and readable. Um, other parts of the, the Office of Strategic Communication, you've already met the, the ladies in the advisory board support um, team. They were the ones that helped you get here this morning and are going to be the ones that you have contact with um, throughout the, um, the time that you're here with TDLR. Um, their contact information is in the materials that, that you've been provided. Um, we've got Anna Clark. And Angelica Lopez Sparks and Delia Luna, and they're awesome. They have uh, 33 different uh, advisory boards and committees that they wrangle, so they have a big job, and um, they really love what they do, and it, it shows in their contact with with all of y'all. And I hope that you'll enjoy getting to know them. Um, we have uh, government relations folks. Uh, that Eric Beverly, Steve Bruno, and Colleen Tran, who are our interface with the legislature and with the governor's office. If there's any anyone in the, the legislature who has a constituent who has an issue with um, things that are happening with their license or they've had contact with one of our licensees that maybe didn't quite go so well, the legislative offices will contact our folks and then we'll help them figure out what happened and how to get it fixed. Um, they spend a lot of time working with Brian on um, testimony that he provides before the various legislative committees and, uh, and they work really hard, especially during the session. Um, we also have a web and digital media team par as part of the Office of Strategic Communications. One of the things that, that they're doing right now is they're televising this education uh, seminar that we're providing for y'all online. Uh, TDLR has a YouTube channel <coughs> and um, we post all the meetings, we live stream meetings, um, they're archived on, on the YouTube channel. Um, if you ever wanna see what an actual uh, board meeting looks like, just to get a feel for what's going to happen when, when y'all are, are here, you can get on there and watch. Um, it's very interesting. There are certain ones you just never know what's going to happen. It's, it's quite exciting. Um, they also are in charge of the public facing website and we get a lot of visits. We try and, and drive as many um, of our visitors uh, to the website as we can to try and get them to um, try and make it easier for them to find the information that they're looking for so that they don't have to pick up the phone and call us. Um, our customer service folks, you'll hear more about them. They do a, a great job, but um, with almost 800,000 licensees, if everybody calls at the same time, it's kind of a problem. So um, we'd like for them to try and find the information they need uh, on the website. The uh, We've got... Uh, We've got the, on the last couple of pages of the presentation is, is our website. Please do get familiar with it. Um, and we've got our, our social media uh, channels listed on there as well. One of the big things that you can do to help us spread the word about the agency is if you are someone who is a consumer of social media, to like us, and not just like us, but also, you know, if you see something that, that we did that you like, retweet it, share it, um, talk about us, because the more uh, people that we have out there evangelizing, the more people will be following us, and then the more people will actually be able to get our information, because um, especially Facebook kind of has an algorithm that, that dictates how many people actually see the things that, that you post and the more followers you have the more people they'll they'll do so um, if you end up getting any uh, telephone calls or emails from a member of the news media uh, as part of your participation in the the work group or on the board um, please contact 
me or Brian or any of the deputy executive directors before responding. Sometimes um, reporters may be looking for information and we want to make sure that we're all speaking with one voice. Um, they're, from time to time they, they may be looking for something and we may be able to help you not comment on something that maybe you probably should stay out of. So I'm from the government and I really am here to help. <laughs> <laughs> So you all know me already. I'm here uh, reporting for Trey Seals, who's actually our customer service division director. I am actually very proud uh, to present uh, his report on his behalf. So you're looking in section number four under customer service. So I came from regulatory program management. I knew we had a customer service division. I knew that they did a lot of work for us. But until I actually got into the details in my new position as deputy, I didn't realize quite how much. On the second page, you're going to see a lot of the numbers of some of the licenses we deal with and the amount of contacts that our staff deal with every day. We're talking the phone calls, the emails, and if anybody's worked in customer service, y'all realize that a lot of the customers calling, they're not happy. They're unhappy about something. They're missing something or they're confused about something. Our staff in customer service are completely amazing staff. They have to keep that energy up every day. They have to keep it at high levels so they can truly fulfill the vision and mission to earn the trust of Texans every day. It is amazing to me. They do it via email, chats, um, on phone calls, and we have amazing technology that Trey, I, I wouldn't have known how to implement it if I was hitting his shoes at the time. Between him and his staff and the supporting staff in the background that actually go through the work of how to transfer phone calls and make sure that when a transfer is made from one customer service rep to an embedded or an escalated phone call comes and we have to get it to a more technical individual that has more information and knowledge on a particular program, that transfer should be seamless. That's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to make that happen. A call center is not an easy thing to run. They do it for 39 programs. I'm not going to uh, sugarcoat anything. Our growth has made their job even more difficult. With 39 programs, they're not going to be experts in 39 different programs. They're going to learn their niches. They're going to have their preferences. They're going to know some of them. But at some point, the questions go beyond general, and they have to pass it over to either the enforcement division or the regulatory program and division. And they have to know who those people are, who those contacts are to get their work done. A typical day, though, 2,000 phone calls. 400 questions received via email, monitoring and engaging the public through social media. They actually monitor our Facebook and Twitter. Along with Tila's help, we're able to get out messages and respond as quickly as possible to things that we see trending, things that could affect our agency's brand, that affect our customers. So our customer service staff truly serve as the voice of the customer to this agency. When something is going wrong, if something is not working right, we're usually hearing about it first from these customer service staff because they got that first phone call or we saw that first tweet and they're kind of like the pulse of what's going on out there uh, in the real world in the public that we s and for the public that we serve. I will tell you this uh, and used to be a lot of jokes that went along with the, um, the information is customer service staff end up being the training ground, the customer service division ends up being the training ground for the rest of the staff. I don't think there's a division here that hasn't stolen an employee at some point from Trey Seals <laughs> because they've developed good staff that have learned a lot about our agency in a short period of time and they've been able to get promotions and move on to other divisions. I know the gentleman next to me and he, and he has done so. I've done so, uh, done so as well. Those staff, I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. Again, every division has benefited from that general knowledge and the advanced skill set that comes with learning to be a public servant and reaching out to customers and dealing with the problems, taking the arrows on the phone and via email because they're, they're going to call. We do get people call and tell us we give great service, but most of them are going to call and tell us they're unhappy about something or that they've got a challenge that we've got to overcome. And these are the staff that are taking care of it on a daily basis. If you're interested in how a call center works, that last uh, third page actually shows you a, a, a flow chart. 
it is important to understand some of these things, the inner workings. I'm not going to get into the details, but words are important. This flow chart shows how the work comes into our agency and how it distributes to different areas and how we have to um, manage the different systems in order to get the, the customer served and satisfied. I think that's all I had to share with regarding trust, uh, customer service. Again, uh, kudos to uh, Trey and all of his staff. They do an amazing job for us. And I will now turn it over to our education examination division. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ray Pizarro, director for the education examination division. Been with TDLR for 17 years, been in state government for 27. Um, it's been a privilege, too, that um, TDLR has put me in charge of this division. It's very, uh, I'm very humbled for that. These, this small group, uh, we have a, a, a small group of folks with uh, large responsibilities. And uh, we, do have, we do work a lot. And I'm going to try to run through some of the things I'm going to tell you to, to, so you get a feel of how it may touch uh, your industry. So for example, um, uh, our responsibilities uh, lies in uh, reviewing and approving schools. Some of the industries require a pre-education uh, before those individuals can get a license in this state. So we have, uh, for example, barber, cosmetology, massage, uh, midwife schools. Uh, we got to approve those schools. And we also have to approve the curriculum and their courses. And uh, for Jeffrey, for example, we, we have to approve uh, courses and providers. So you guys get a feeling of that, Jude. We're going to be looking at and we're going to be working on how we're going to fold that in and approving those courses and providers. So that's, that's kind of a, uh, some of the, uh, one of the few things we do. We also have an abundance of an examination. There are a lot of the industries that require uh, an exam component to get a license. So Wes, uh, in your group, there is the, the, the low, high flow, the LPG exams. Those are going to be three more exam types that are going to be added to our third party exam vendor to administer those tests. Last uh, fiscal year, we administered over 70,000 exams in one year. Since 2002, we've been administering over 650,000 exams. So we do know exams, and we do know how to uh, uh, look at the questions, of course, with the help of subject matter experts. So we're going to have some of you involved in shaping those exams and continuing to make sure that the exam stays current, the items that aren't exam stay current. That's important to us. And, and we'll be able to do that with the same vendor that's been, you guys have been using, PSI, and we're going to move that over to us. Fortunately, the exam cost is going to go down with, uh, with this group. And PSI is going to administer those, those examinations at a lower cost. And we'll talk about more about that later. Uh, some of the other things we do is uh, training and outreach. Uh, so Keith, some of the, the, the training that we'll do in the outreach will be going to uh, the courses, going to uh, the areas where the motorcycle training is being done. We currently do that. Uh, one of the things we do for the offender education program, our group actually have to approve the workshop and we go out and teach the instructors. We don't want to be in that business of a provider. So we're farming that out, but we do have the knowledge and we do understand what it takes uh, to be able to make sure that those instructors have the right tools uh, so that they can perform their job. And again, as you guys were saying in the meetings that I was with you on Saturday, uh, we, don't wanna, we do not want to uh, encourage people to ride. That resonated with me. It's, it's all about safety. And that's what this agency is concerned of. If you look at all of the programs we regulate, it's all about safety. It's all about how can we make it better to ensure that the folks, the Texans are out there are doing business or they're going to get their hair cut and they're not going to get their ears chopped off, right? Or they're going to get a barber and not cut their neck. Those are our safety. If you go out and get a bad haircut, we're going to say get somebody else, right? It's not about the haircut, it's about the safety. So we're, we're concerned, we, we're always staying involved with the groups, with you guys. We're going to have more commerce with the motorcycle than the, than the fields folks. We're just going to look at the exam component. But with you guys, we're going to be looking at providers, courses, how do we make sure that those training sites are done the way they need to be done? And all that takes some rule changes, right? And as you notice how the laws have changed, we are going to have to shape those things to incorporate those little pieces to make sure that we and you guys in the industry is comfortable. 
Oh, that's all I have right now. I know you guys are drinking out of a fire hose, and so there's a lot, and you'll, you'll notice that all of the things we're telling you have you seen before, there is some cross connection. We, we, we work in a functional alignment type thing. So we will go out to schools and do audits, things like that. But you hear from Tanya, she's doing a lot of the inspections. So there's a lot of cross uh, work, but that's how we, that I think and I believe truly, that's how we be, have become very successful because we allow each group to take charge of those things. And so there's some of the things that were, I was trying to communicate on Saturday to you guys, and I know that's a little bit difficult to, to try to get folks to understand that in, what do they gave me, 10 minutes? <laughs> that's not enough time. And, as, and, and Jeffrey and I had a conversation, and he said, I think I know where you're going with this. And so you'll see as we move on with you guys and have that interaction, you're going to understand our functional alignment and how we work in little work groups, sub work groups, uh, help shape the exam to make sure that the folks are out there getting the latest and greatest CEs. All of those things, are, we're, we're all about making sure that we're safe. That's all I have for right now. Wow. I'm Ron Foster, Director of Enforcement. I have to say I feel a little bit like I've been played for the fool here because uh, I was told down to the minute how much time I had. Looks like we're about 15 minutes ahead of schedule, and I don't know if I'm looking at my executive office to know if I've got an extra 15 minutes to talk. Um, you got some time? Uh, because, you know, I, I, I prepared a statement here to try to keep myself uh, on schedule for y'all. It's definitely good to see y'all here. Um, Yes, I'm an attorney, and yes, my staff has attorneys, but we like to think of ourselves as the good guys. I would like to talk to you a little bit about our division, our teams, and the work that we do. So what do we do? On page one, we are responsible for investigating and resolving complaints in all programs regulated by TDLR. Our division, by fostering collaboration through the combined efforts of our attorneys, investigators, legal assistants, and administrative assistants, works together to do our very best to process complaints and bring cases to resolution. Last year alone, we opened nearly 10,900 cases and brought to resolution over 10,100 cases with about 121 employees in our division. You can see on our enforcement handout, page one, the basic structure of the division. We are organized into three sections that mirror the life cycle of a complaint as it progresses through our division the intake, investigations, and prosecution sections. Our intake section is led by Cheryl Wilson. It's the first step. It's where we receive complaints and review them to determine jurisdiction, perform initial research to identify the respondent, and evaluate whether that allegation would substantiate a violation of the law or rules. When a complaint satisfies these threshold inquiries, the complaint is opened as a case and assigned to an investigator. The next step, investigations, is led by Greg Dotson and includes field staff in regions outside Austin. Our investigators are tasked with developing a detailed story of the case through witness interviews, requests for records, subpoena of documents as necessary, and lastly, on-site inspections are performed as appropriate. The end product is a written report of the investigation, which is then placed in the case file and forwarded to the prosecutor for review. The third step is our prosecution section, which is led by Daryl Coons, our legal assistant manager, and John Medlock, our chief prosecutor, who manages a staff of 17 prosecutors. Our prosecutors have discretion to determine the proper resolution of each case. For example, when, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I was talking pretty loud, so let me bring that closer. <clears throat> When there is evidence of a violation, the prosecutor may issue a notice of alleged violation, which we call an NOAB assessing penalties and or license sanctions. When there is no evidence of a violation, the case will be closed. In some circumstances, the case may be informally resolved, such as when there is corrective action taken and a warning letter may be issued. How do we do our work? Using this structure described, we process the complaints we receive, basically from three sources or buckets of work. Bucket number one is the consumer complaints, bucket number two is department complaints, and bucket number three is criminal history review.
Consumer complaints are typically received from consumers receiving services from our licensees, but may also include complaints from individuals involved in the industry and even from government officials and other agencies. Department complaints are those arising from periodic inspections of regulated entities, persons, or equipment, as well as from sting operations conducted by our own investigation section. Criminal history complaints are generated because we perform a criminal history background check on all licensed applicants. Upon review of the criminal history, if a prosecutor does not clear the applicant immediately, a case will be opened to further investigate the applicant's criminal history in order to make a determination whether to deny or revoke the applicant's license. Now, how do we ensure consistency? It's very important to what we do. We have three principal documents which help us to do this. The Complaint Resolution Procedures Manual, the Enforcement Plan, and the Criminal Conviction Guidelines. The Complaint Resolutions Procedure Manual sets forth the standard procedures which our staff follow in handling con complaints through the process, from intake through investigations to the prosecutor. These procedures address cases in all the different programs we regulate. <coughs> the next two documents we create with the assistance of industry professionals such as yourself, typically from the advisory boards, for each program that we regulate, the enforcement plan and the criminal conviction guidelines. The enforcement plan sets out the penalties and license sanctions that are applicable to specific violations of the law or rules enforced by the agency. Our attorneys are required to use the enforcement plan when issuing a notice of alleged violation, which assesses a penalty or sanction, and prosecutors may only deviate from the enforcement plan with the permission of the director of enforcement. The criminal conviction guidelines identify the specific criminal convictions that may render an applicant unsuitable for licensure in any particular program. It will also list the reasons why the identified crimes are considered to relate to an applicant for a license. The next two pages that you have, pages three and four, are simply a flow chart of the process that I described in a step-by-step -step format with decision points. The last page I would like for you to take note of is the division's key statistics. It's page five of our handout. The performance measures at the top are used to assess divisions, our division's success in processing complaints. Among the statistics included are cases open, cases closed, average time to close, percent of complaints resolved within six months, and percent of complaints resulting in disciplinary action. We have provided data comparing fiscal years 2018 and 2019 for you. Next, you will see a pie chart which shows the sources of the complaints. This refers back to the buckets that I was talking about earlier. As you can see, the consumer complaints make up nearly 50% of all of our complaints, followed by criminal history and department complaints. Lastly, you have been provided information on our case outcomes below, which include orders, the penalties, sanctions such as um, revocations, suspensions, denials, and consumer restitution, which is something we strive to get <coughs> on our cases. Now this concludes my prepared presentation, and since I've, since I've had so much other time, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. Can I, can I ask you a quick question? Go for what it. is the criminal conviction? Guy? Is that somebody that has a, a, a criminal history prior to applying, or is that some event that happened while they had a license? It both. So we check every time when a person does an original application and when they do an, a, a, a renewal application. So uh, whether and we ask them, but whether they tell us or not, we're going to do it. We're going to check it and and then we're gonna take appropriate action based upon the criminal conviction guidelines, whether we need to deny the license if it's an original application or revoke it if it's already in the license that's been issued. Ron, can you touch on the role that the advisory board will play in helping establish this criminal Yes, absolutely, Brian. I, I mentioned it just briefly in there. What happens is we put a work group together for each one of the advisory boards, right, That uh, for the programs that we regulate. And our prosecutors will initially draft uh, a document similar to what we've got in our other programs, so we have some working draft to start with. Then we will have members selected from the um, advisory board. I think it's usually three or four members that work on the work group for us, and it's the enforcement work group. And we uh, use your expertise and your no knowledge to help us be able to craft the enforcement plan and the criminal conviction guidelines that are relevant to your particular program. It matters for different programs. So, for example, 
uh, the towing criminal conviction guidelines have uh, DWI on there. It kind of makes sense, right? You don't want to have a person that has a repeat offender for drunk driving to be driving your tow trucks around. So each one can be tailored specifically to the program and the licenses that are in that program. Any other questions? Well, thank you. Well, thank you. Good morning. My name is Tanya Guthrow. I am the Director of <coughs> Field Inspections. And it's really fitting that I follow um, uh, Ron in as the Director of Enforcement because one of the things that's uh, important at TDLR is that there is a distinction between an investigation and an inspection. And um, our staff perform on-site, unscheduled inspections that are required by statute. Um, and it, they're on a variety of different periodic schedules. Um, but while we're out there, our goal is to uh, not only identify violations, but also to educate the licensees on how to get into compliance. Um, I actually started with the agency in 1984. And yes, I was very, very young. Um, and I've been lucky enough and honored enough to work actually for uh, a variety of the folks that you'll meet or that you'll see or be introduced to today. I was a licensing manager uh, under Dee Dee McEachern and a field inspector under Christina Kaiser and happy to be working under her now that she is the uh, deputy executive director. Um, our group is organized, you can see here, we're recently moved from three to four regions, gratefully so. Uh, one of the important aspects to our organizational chart is that we have a uh, robust support training, a little, even closer, okay. Let me try again. So we have a, a very large and robust support training and analytics team. Um, and the regions are organized by the uh, central region, which includes the city of El Paso all the way to <coughs> east of the Austin area. Uh, the East Region, which includes Houston, the surrounding areas, including Beaumont and the Upper Gulf Coast, and we have a Houston field office. Uh, the North Region, which includes the Panhandle and stretches east to the Arkansas and Louisiana borders, and we have a field office in Fort Worth. The South Region includes uh, San Antonio and all of South Texas from Laredo to Corpus Christi. Um, and our support training analytics team are located uh, some in Austin, but also out in the field and away from the central area here. Our next uh, image is the current configuration of our regions. Um, one of the important things to note is that we do do these on-site uh, periodic and some pre-license inspections, but it is only for the programs that require it by statute. And uh, there are some other inspections that require um, certain expertise that you'll hear about in the Regulatory Program Management Division. Um, and you can see that we do barbers, cosmetology, driver education schools, midwifery schools, licensed dog and cat breeders, massage establishments, uh, orthotists and prosthetist facilities, vehicle storage facilities, uh, used auto parts recyclers. Um, we also maintain and manage a uh, mold remediation project inspection, but we've outsourced that, outsourced that back to uh, the DSS, DSHS uh, agency. One of the ways that we look for efficiencies is that the inspectors are cross-trained to perform multiple types of inspections. As you can see, we have a number of uh, different responsibilities, and it just makes sense that they're able to move between different types of inspections based on where they're located. Um, the staff complete their administrative duties on Mondays, and then they're out in the field doing inspections Tuesday through Friday, just driving from one inspection to the next. While they're doing the inspections, the inspectors use a reference guide to make sure that they're following the guidelines of the law and the rule. Uh, they look for uh, the check license statuses, look for any documents that are supposed to be maintained, and check for he health and safety violations. Um, if there are any serious violations that are found, the inspectors then 
write a, an enforcement report, and then that is part of the workload that we hand over to our enforcement division. Um, we use a route optimization program for most and some of our largest programs, but not all of them. Sometimes they, it doesn't uh, lend itself to uh, using the route optimization program. The, the program considers a variety of factors, including the location of the inspectors, the licensed facility location, the inspection due date, and the seriousness or the potential harm that could uh, happen if there are violations on site. Um, the support training and analytics team monitor our workload performances, but they also develop and conduct, uh, conduct training. They implement new technology, and I think it is a statement to the, our leadership that what we're doing is investing in those folks who are the face of TDLR, who are out there doing the inspections and representing the agency. So the managers, the support training analytics team, and myself are all here to support those inspectors while they're out there doing the inspections. Um, one of the important things that is uh, recent is that the inspectors have been trained to identify and report potential um, human trafficking. Since we are out in the field and throughout the state of Texas, it's important that the staff knows how to do that. Um, and we're currently working with the anti-human trafficking group that you'll hear more about. Um, we're showing them our processes, but also importantly, we're learning from them and the experience that they're bringing to the table. Um, we also provide, you know, presentations and go to uh, different kinds of association meetings and provide information about the inspection process. The next page you'll see are um, inspection numbers. Um, and one of the things you may not see here because it was back in uh, fiscal year 2017, but we had a big jump from um, 20, about 24,000 inspections to that 36,000 mark. And part of that was due to working in collaboration with our enforcement division to make sure that the violations that we are citing and reporting on are targeted to the most serious violations and not just things that can be administratively fixed. You can see our trends throughout the year. And the next page shows our uh, workload and the breakdown of it. And you can see that COS stands for cosmetology. <laughs> So one of the things we tell all of our inspectors before we even do an interview is like more than 60% of your time is going to be spent performing cosmetology inspections. But that doesn't mean that we don't also dedicate ourselves to those smaller but very important um, program types that need inspections too. The next page shows uh, where the licensed facilities that we inspect are located. So where you see that orange image there, those are the most populous areas <coughs> in the state. And of course, Houston is a big area and continues to grow and be a place where we need to perform a lot of inspections. But boy, the DFW area is really giving Houston a run for its money. In the next page, you're going to see uh, where all the inspectors are located. As you see, we try to hire the inspectors in locations where our workload is to try to increase our efficiency. So that's it for uh, field inspections. And if you, I guess I'll hand it over to the next di division unless somebody has a question. I do have one quick question. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, I think I heard this. I just want you to confirm. So compliance inspections are separate from complaint investigations. So Ron's team would handle complaint investigations and you handle more. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's correct. Are you, are you adding more inspectors? Well, um, I believe at this time, and I'll let uh, Charlotte Medler, who's the director of the regulatory program uh, group, go ahead and uh, describe that for you. But it's not, um, I don't think, yeah, it's not statutory required to be a periodic uh, inspection. So it's going to be handled through her group. Can I ask a real quick question yes. about just the, just the philosophy? Yes. Um, we get inspections in the fuel stuff. A lot of times, if there's some minor violations or discrepancies, you've got the opportunity to correct it. Like you might have 15 days. Can you? I mean, can you just speak to that? Is that something y'all typically do? Or absolutely, we work very closely with our enforcement division to make sure that we are only ser sending the most serious violations to them for potential administrative action. 
Um, so if it is something that can be corrected um, on site or it's, you know, more of an administrative paperwork type violation, then it really is on the inspectors to educate the licensees and help them get into compliance. The um, licensees do indicate that they're going to make the corrections. They sign a proof of inspection form. And we're recently starting um, to do a small percentage, but still some follow-up inspections to ensure that folks are doing what they've said they will do. I just wanted to point out that also if it does get to a prosecutor and we, you know, for example, didn't have information that the correction was already uh, made, uh, the prosecutor may issue a no notice of alleged violation because of that, but usually there's communication that happens after that. You know, you get a notice that says you owe money or something's going to happen. You tend to call the person <laughs> that, that you need to to get it resolved. So the prosecutors are all the time receiving additional information on their cases, and they could still issue a warning letter even at that point. You know, they could withdraw that notice and say, okay, they made the correction that they needed to. There's no safety, no health and safety issue here at play, we can go ahead and uh, close that case with a warning letter very often. Not it, I'm not gonna say every time, but we can do that. The cosmetology department, I guess, is one of the most um, sought out inspections over all the other programs. Is that because it's a leading? It's like, because the, the program is so large. Okay. So, um, you know, you can see that that is a huge, large percentage of our workload. Um, and that's why you see on that pie chart. It's not because it's a more important inspection. It's just there's more of them. And you know that driving down the street, you can see, wow, there's a nail shop, there's a hair salon. Yeah. Yeah, I asked that because the gas stations, you know, is it going to be very comparable to that? So I was wondering if mm -hmm. maybe next year this is going to look more half of the divvy of between those two. Now. Well, I think I'm going to let Charlotte get into that with okay. you guys because there is a distinction. Uh, uh, we've got more information coming your way. I hope they gave her a lot of time. <laughs> well, let's give it back to her. <laughs> Hi, my name is Laura Hernandez. I'm a manager in the licensing division. I am um, filling in for Dee Dee McEacher, who's the director of licensing. Um, for our program, our licensing div division evaluates applicants' criminal history, required pre-education and credentials, experience and employment history, experience, I'm sorry, insurance, bonding, and net worth requirements, and continuing education courses. Um, we review these for um, both initial applications and renewal applications. Uh, the agency's 39 programs includes 223 unique license types for more than 832 licensees and um, in nine different databases. Um, in one of the uh, handouts or sheets with this uh, presentation, shows you the different programs and the license types with each one. For an example, there's not just one air conditioning license, there's like four different ones within that one program. In order to um, be efficient and have cross-training, we have seven different teams that are inside the licensing division. We're split up by different programs, um, similar license types, similar databases. One of the handouts also shows you the different teams. Uh, for example, uh, the first team is the tools team, which is my team. It handles the different uh, licenses for towing, vehicle storage facilities, used auto parts, and several others. The fuel metering quality um, program will be on my team. Uh, the motorcycle safety team will be on the safety regulators team. We also have a licensing support team that assists all the licensing teams as far as uh, DPS background checks. They handle uh, mail, procedures, forms, um, imaging. all I have right now for our division. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so my name is Charlotte Melder, and I am the director of the Regulatory Program Management Division, which is, I refer to as RPM. I have been with TDLR for 12 years, uh, 17 years in state government. 
the first 10 years I was here, I was a prosecutor. I was working alongside Ron underneath Christina. I moved over to the Regulatory Program Management Division about two years ago. I was promoted to the director in December. So this is fairly new as being in this position, but I've been with this group and I've worked all of the programs and I love this agency and I love this division. And so what I'm gonna do is kind of give you an overview of the entire division and save the fuel metering and quality to the end. Um, so you'll have to see what the whole division does and then I'll talk about um, the specifics. Um, RPM is slightly different than the other divisions. Um, this division, whereas, say, licensing issues a license, um, we um, tailor, I'm going to read what I wrote, um, RPM helps to ensure the effective administration of each program internally and facilitates the needs of the industries externally. So we are very tailored to what the needs are internally and externally, which is fantastic and so much fun for us. So internally, we assist other divisions, such as helping with the exam questions when they come up for the programs, um, reviewing different things, uh, helping enforcement with in, uh, their investigations, um, helping customer service by answering technical questions, and um, helping out licensing when they have questions. So we do most of the programs in regulatory program management, not all of them. Uh, we are not going to be working with the motorcycle safety program because that's mostly an education uh, and examination function. So we won't have a component in your program um, unless that changes and things change constantly. Um, what we do is we have specialists for nearly every program, like I said. Um, our division is where the industry gets the personalized service from the department, um, meaning that our program specialists differ in what they do from program to program. So um, we have divided our, if you look at our organizational chart, which I believe is page two, um, you'll see that we have divided it into groupings. We have the building and mechanical under Yvonne Feinlive as the manager. We have the medical health and professionals under Heather Muir. We have business and consumer safety under our newest hire, Stuart Stranat, who is here on the corner over uh, in the back. And then business and professionals, which is under the deputy director um, of the division, Lee Parham. I wanted to touch on each of the programs, not each of them, some of them due to time constraints, um, and give you an example of what I mean by tailoring the needs internally and externally. So starting with the business and professionals, you'll see that there are two folks listed under electricians. These are licensed electricians who have many responsibilities, including doing the expert inspections for investigations for enforcement. So when a, a complaint comes into our enforcement division and it's complaining about faulty wiring or something like that, enforcement doesn't have specialists who know whether or not that's actually faulty. So they use the experts in the regulatory program management division to go out, these two gentlemen throughout the state, and do that inspection for them give them the report that they use. They go and testify in court for them, saying, yes, this is what we found, this is the violation, et cetera. Um, they also sit on state and national boards. They're involved as the second responders for emergency disasters in Texas for BOAT, which is the Building Officials Association of Texas. They do an assessment of the disaster area or whatever it may be to get rebuilding done faster. They do job sweeps. They work with other states on reciprocity groups and they provide trainings throughout the state. So that's very tailored to what is needed internally and externally. Um, if you hop on over to our business and consumer safety group, our architectural barriers group, um, most people say, oh, it's the ADA. It is not the ADA. Um, our program actually was signed before the ADA went into effect. And it's similar, but not the same. Ours is a construction law. so. If a building is built or renovated, um, then our architectural barrier group regulate the construction and alter alteration to make sure they comply with the Texas accessibility standards. They monitor the projects through a system that was built specifically for them, um, to uh, for this industry. They Inspections are done by third party licensees. Our architectural barrier group stays on top of making sure that those procedures that are required by that group is fo are followed. And they answer about 100 technical questions a day 
emails that come in from either customer service or directly to them saying, hey, if I build this, is this going to comply with the standards? What about this? What about this? It's very technical and very time consuming, but they, these five individuals spend all of their time working very hard making sure that that's done. Um, also, if you just hop on over to the business and professionals group, for example, you'll see the first group in an entire line of boilers. This is a larger group because these individuals are inspectors throughout the state, different from the inspectors from the inspections group who are, and I'll get into the details of, uh, of the difference there, but they inspect boilers, which is a very technical inspection that needs to be done, and they don't inspect all the boilers in the state, just the ones that are not inspected by third-party authorized inspectors. It's kind of complicated, and I won't get into it because it's not your program, but I just want to point out the different aspects of our division. Um, another group is our combative sports specialist. So any MMA event or boxing event in the state of Texas is fully regulated through our division. Um, the staff approve bouts, they monitor weigh-ins, they're at the ringside ensuring compliance, they're checking medicals, tax payments, etc. So that's a whole other aspect of what the agency does in our division. Um, okay, so now I'll get to motor fuels. Um, with motor fuels, you'll see that there are seven individuals. They are under Tim Foskey. Um, all of the individuals in motor fuels were hired from Texas Department of Agriculture, so TDA, so they have experience in the program. Um, they are new to TDLR because the program is, and they, are, they do multiple functions, one of which is they are a skimmer response team. So if a complaint comes in about skimmers, they immediately drop everything and run out and do that inspection. Our very first complaint, once our system was up and running, the, in, the complaint came in and our, um, we don't know what to call them, they're program specialist. They do an inspection investigation. We joked uh, and called them inspectivators, but they, they go out and they, they um, inspect or investigate. Um, they were there within an hour, within an hour of the complaint coming in. So the sooner you get the complaint to, to us, the sooner we can have somebody out there looking to see if there is a skimmer. They also assist enforcement with the motor fuel quantity complaints. So they have the provers in the back of the trucks, they go out and they help them with those investigations. So to address the question that was asked, field inspections, um, <coughs> under Tanya who was addressing, is not in going to be involved in motor fuels because there is no statutory requirement for an inspection to be done on a routine basis. So every year or every two years. In motor fuels, the in there is there are no inspection, it's just an investigation, so it's going to be complaint driven for now. So if a complaint comes in, we go out and investigate or inspect whatever the complaint is. While we're there for any reason, if we're there for a skimmer complaint, we will make sure that they're in compliance and check things. We may be adding an audit function later on, depending on how things go, and if we're going to be relying very heavily on this work group on what needs to be done, how it needs to be done, and how we need to be structured. We've put things in place right now in anticipation of that because it kind of got rolling. Um, but we are open to change, we are open to adjustment, and we are here to serve the industry and make sure that everything is being done for the motor fuels program. And I can answer any questions that you have, probably. <laughs> question, ma'am. Yes. The fuel quality, how do you take the complaint from a customer? So for fuel quality? Yes, ma'am. Okay, fuel quality is a little bit different only because of the um, statutory authority doesn't go into effect for TDLR until September 1 of 2020. Um, so when we get those complaints in, everything is online. It goes to our intake division through enforcement. Their investigators go out, take the sample. Or wait, they initially refer it to the OHE's office, um, and then they go out, do the investigation for their office, get the sampling done, get the results back, wrap up their report, and send it to the OAG's office. September 1, that'll change. Uh, I think recently, when the inspector comes to the store, they give you a kit, and we have to call our uh, technician to come out and take the uh, testing and send to third party to get the result. That's the way it used to be done, now we do it. Oh, okay, okay, that's better. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> we're, we're hoping that that's better is the way you say everything. How many, <laughs> how many, compl many complaints has to be 
done from the customer. Every single complaint will go out. Thank you. Yes, the, the law has changed. I, I got a question on, on field quantity complaints. Mm -hmm. You can get there within an hour? I was saying skimmer complaints. They oh, got there sorry. within an hour. Um, we go out as quickly as we can. The fuel quantity complaints also go through our enforcement division. So they go through intake, and like Ron was saying, intake makes sure that there is at least an allegation a violation has occurred, whether it has or not. Um, then if an allegation has been alleged that we have jurisdiction over, that it goes to an investigator. Once the investigator gets it, they refer it to our division and have one of our, our folks in that group go out and do the inspection uh, and then write up their report and send it to the investigator and move on from there. So they don't live in RPM. Yes? When the plate is, is lodged, do you make any effort to uh, confirm that there was an actual purchase or that they were, other than they were sitting in New York City and, and decide they're just going to mess with somebody and call you and say, hey, this guy down here is not selling the right quantity. Do you ask for a receipt or any kind of confirmation that they were there? Ron wants to answer, but I'm not going to let him. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and I, I'll answer for him and then I'll pass it if he wants to answer if it's not sufficient. Um, the, we do not ask for proof of they were actually at the station, but our investigators will ask for everything they possibly have, which includes a receipt. If they don't have a receipt, the investigator will look at all information available before they pass it on to the prosecutor, who will look at all of the evidence. And if there is no evidence of a violation, the case won't go forward. So it's, it is, everything is investigated, everybody has the right to complain, but it doesn't mean it'll go anywhere. Does that make sense? Yes, unless, you might, <laughs> unless we're responsible for starting to prove up our position before we can proof of any purchase was ever made. In other words, are, are you going to ask us to go effort, make, make efforts on our part to prove that we're okay? I guess the short answer is yes. I mean, there's a threshold inquiry that has to be, a threshold that has to be met at the intake section, as I was describing before, which is just really, do we have jurisdiction? Because we get complaints all the time that go, should go to other agencies or something like that. Is there a, an identified respondent? Who is the who's the bad guy or who's the alleged bad guy? And was there something that was could be a violation if it were true? Right? That's all of our that's all our intake section does at that point. We don't have enough facts at that point to make a determination whether anything actually was a violation, right? So the investigator's job is to go out and interview and request documents. And so that may be efforts on your part to like answer a question. I mean if, if that's a Right, and if and that's what the investigator will find, right? Because they're the one, they're the fact finders, right? And they're a neutral party. They're they're not advocating for the position of the complainant. They're just trying to gather the facts. So they may have to ask for records, like I told you before, where we we have the the rules and the law require records to be produced when requested. We can also subpoena records if we have to. We don't normally need to do that, but we get whatever records we can, and we interview the parties as needed to find out what the facts are. And typically that's all that needs to be done because once the investigator wraps up their report and goes to a prosecutor, the prosecutor is going to look at the facts and say, wow, there's no evidence to substantiate the violation. I'm closing that case in sufficient evidence. And if there's any anything unclear about it, the, invest, the prosecutor can send it back to an investigator and say, hey, you know, there's this rock you didn't turn over. I need a little bit more information. You need to ask this other question. And they can do that. But that's, that's, the, that's the due process that, that we do in order to make sure that the facts are being, um, that we're getting all of the facts necessary to make the proper determination on the case. I mean, there, there is, I guess, you know, going to be some work involved in doing that, but the, the result is if there's no response to it, then all we have is one side of the story. And we wanna make sure we make every effort to try to get your side of the story or whoever's side of the story in every case. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of proactive um, gas stations that we do work for. And so yes. when they would get a complaint, you know, the customer would probably go in and complain to the store or um, just go directly to the QR code on the uh, sticker. 
um, is there any kind of immediate we go to the owner or on file of we've got a complaint at this store so that they can start being proactive as well um, by getting those documents to you immediately so you come back they have a calibration for it they have a receipt of when that guy made that's the purchase that's a very good point so usually, they would go that go that a, route to make y'all's job easier yes that's a very good point usually what so what should happen when a case gets opened at intake is a letter gets generated that lets the person know that there was a case open right the respondent gets a letter right away that lets them know hey somebody filed a complaint against you and it might not have a lot of information in it because at that point it's just saying hey it's been open but when it gets to an investigator a short time later that investigator will also send a letter to you asking for information and so if you were making proactive efforts you would have that ready right away to give to the investigator investigator can zip up the case and you know get it over to a prosecutor more quickly that like that any other questions well you know to, to Gary's point a minute ago we had a an employee that needed to be separated from our company and that individual proceeded to call in complaints on several several of our locations and so that caused us to you know hire somebody a third party to go out there and you know make sure everything was fine so we incurred that cost can there be a recourse against that individual well that may be a private civil matter as far as the department goes you know we have to take in good faith the complaints that are filed with us and mm -hmm. we do have an electronic case filing system I, did, I didn't mention it before but so we we can track who's filing complaints and how many complaints are being made against uh, individuals or entities or whatever it is whatever your business is so you know we can see those type of trends um, at the end of the day when we get a complaint filed we have a duty to investigate that mm -hmm. case right and you know we can't just assume that because John Smith filed five previous complaints that they're all in that everything hereafter is invalid right. but we we will understand the situation okay. as, as it develops sure. and we are getting more is more. that or can that be public information if there is a repetitive um, complaint system on it is public information as far as open records requests can always be made I mean I don't think we typically put that on our website in any right. way I mean we're not shaming anyone like that uh, bad complainants or whatever but open record requests can be made by anyone at any time and our agency is very responsive to that um, and makes it easy for you to be able to request like who filed complaints against me blah 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 and they can produce all of those documents for you actually I should have let GC answer that that's a juicy <laughs> question <laughs> general counsel <laughs> that's a good statement actually I want How quickly? How quickly would those records be released if we were to, if you were to call in, for instance, this case? He okay, calls well, an open records it. request. I'll let. It's supposed to be as soon oh. as possible, but no later than ten days. But um, that's okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to point out just really quickly, not all of our skimmer complaints will be received and out in a, within an hour. I was just bragging on the first one that came in. <laughs> uh, we do try to get out there as quickly as possible, no later than 24 hours, if at all possible. But I was just wanted to point that out. I also wanted to say that not only for our mu uh, motor fuels program, but um, the individuals in this division, they set up work group meetings. Um, they help with writing the rules, drafting those uh, with our general counsel's division. Um, they do plan reviews. Some of the specialists in fact inspect uh, manufacturers who ship into Texas, some in other states, some in other countries. So this division is very diverse um, and works really hard to make sure that the internal customers and our external customers are getting what they need in a very tailored way. Okay, yes. Okay, sure. The, um, the skimmer? Mm -hmm like program I guess from coming from TDA it was up in the air on who had jurisdiction on that mm -hmm. um, when you say the response your inspectors or investigators or responses in mm -hmm. the hour is that from the gas station calling saying we're getting customer complaints is that from a maintenance company that says hey we found this skimmer and do we call y'all first do we call local authorities who do you call who do you okay so yes um, <laughs> we are we set up a skimmer complaint online and if you go to our website, it says file a complaint. In the very first sentence, it says if you have a skimmer complaint, go to the unlicensed track. You go to the unlicensed track and motor fuels and skimmer complaints and reports is one of the options. You click on that and you enter all the information. So 
anybody can file a complaint on a suspected skimmer. We have had people who have gone to a location and shown receipts saying, um, I've only gone to this one location, I think something's not right, or uh, insurance companies will send in, we've looked at the information, uh, we think something's not right at this location, this is the only nexus of these um, issues, uh, that sort of thing. So as we're developing this and as the Fusion Center gets up and running, we're going to um, start sending the reports that are coming in once their rules are drafted and go into effect, uh, well, they're drafted, but once they go into effect, um, we'll be following those. We are sending every report that we have over to the people who we believe are going to be running that, that section. So that is already functioning right now. So don't call local police. Don't what? <laughs> don't call local police. Oh, no, you could Still absolutely call local police. Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Can I interject something? Yeah. From the police side of this? Yeah. Every, every police department is going to respond to this differently. Mm -hmm. and absolutely. That's part of the reason why I'm sitting here is because part of what I've been tasked with is training law enforcement. So depending on where you're talking about, you might get a police off you might not get a police officer for hours or days. And when that police officer shows up, he may not have any idea what he's looking at. Uh, so it's kind of a toss up at this point. So I think your best bet always, because you are talking about a felony offense, is to call the police first. Uh, but if you have an agent, you know, you might be out in the middle of nowhere with two deputies for a gigantic county and said, well, it's a crime that already occurred, it's not violent, so we'll get back to you in a day or two. Yeah, you should immediately call TDLR next. Right. Because at that point, then it's removal of it and, and disposing of it, obviously. And so we've found them from El Paso all the way to Texarkana and top every all over. And so we've had um, different police, obviously, like you said, handle it different ways. Um, and we've had them tell, them tell us to just take it off. And then we've had police actually come out and do it like as if we were the criminals. So, you know, it's, it's, you get that, you get that uh, broad spectrum. And so we just want to make sure that we're doing it. Um, and we still handle it like the worst case scenario where we do wear gloves, put it in a bag, you know, and then try to follow it's up. It's always better that you do and I've trained quite a bit of their inspectors. My, are they inspectors or investigators? I, I always get confused. Inspectigators. <laughs> this is Brian Francis. So Adam, you're taking us down into the weeds, and my motorcycle guys are rev revving up a little bit over here. <laughs> you guys are going to have your first meeting uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a work group that deals specifically with the skimmer uh, a aspect of this uh, program. So we're going to start getting down into those details. The answers you want, you're going to help us create. Uh, so, yes, there's a lot of um, varied interpretations of how it's going to work out. So we'll get those answers to you. We've got Brad Schulte here, the, uh, the drafter. So everything in the rules that you like, Brad wrote. Everything that you didn't, someone else wrote. So. <laughs> but we'll, we'll make sure we get there. But you're not going to get the answer today in this moment. But you are going to help us create the answer as we move forward through this process, okay? Good morning. Uh, again, welcome to TDLR, and thank you for being here. Thank you for your service on uh, on these groups. It's going to be very critical to our success in implementing these programs going forward. So, so thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Bowman. Uh, I'm the general counsel for TDLR, <coughs> and I have the privilege of uh, overseeing the office of general counsel. It's a very experienced, uh, talented bunch of attorneys and legal support staff. Uh, we are the TDLR division that provides uh, general legal services and legal advice to our commission, to executive management, to the entire department, uh, and that includes providing legal support uh, for, your, uh, for your groups and, and your meetings. And I'll get to that in a little more detail uh, here in a, in a minute. We have uh, two deputy general counsels that help me oversee the staff and the workload. Uh, Della Lindquist is, is here today. Uh, Charles Johnson is the other uh, Deputy General Counsel. We have a group of Assistant General Counsels that uh, help with uh, each of our programs. So each of those, we have 39 programs at TDLR. And so each of those attorneys is assigned to three, four, five of those programs and they work very closely with the program staff and with 
your boards and, and work groups on those, on those programs. And you'll get to meet uh, three of those folks uh, a little bit later, uh, Derek and Mark and Jessica. They'll be doing the open government uh, training for you. And there the attorneys are actually going to be working with your, your various uh, programs. So you'll get a chance to, uh, to meet them here in just a few minutes. Uh, our kind of our guiding philosophy is proactive legal counsel. So we want to roll up our sleeves and be at the table with uh, other staff, program staff that are working on, on issues uh, as they're moving forward. We don't want to just sit back and wait for legal questions uh, to, to come to us. Uh, what do we do? We have a, a wide variety of, as you can see, of, of responsibilities. It's everything from contracts, working with the Attorney General's Office on litigation, uh, advising our commission on uh, their decisions in contested cases, uh, et cetera. And there are a few of those that I want to uh, highlight for you today that really uh, impact more directly uh, your programs and your, your work uh, on these uh, boards and work groups. Uh, first of all, you will see uh, one of our lawyers at, at every one of your meetings at the staff table serving as legal counsel for that meeting and we're there to help with any legal questions that come up, uh, kind of staying on the right path on open meetings, uh, answering any kind of general questions that, that come up that, that we can help with and chiming in when we need to. And then secondly, we will be presenting, sometimes along with other staff or with program staff, we're presenting rules, proposed rules uh, to your uh, advisory board or work group for, uh, for your review and comments and edits and, and so forth. So we'll be, we'll be kind of leading those discussions with you and a little bit later today we'll be starting to dive into that uh, with the, the first uh, work group uh, meeting. And just to put a little bit of texture to rulemaking, I don't want to steal Derek's thunder too much here. We'll be doing a more detailed presentation about that. But just to give you an idea of what we do with rulemaking, uh, our attorneys work uh, very closely with other staff of the department from RPM, enforcement, licensing, et cetera, to help develop rules. Very often we'll be working with a subgroup of your uh, advisory board or, or work group as well. And we do all the, the drafting, kind of putting together what the rules uh, should look like. And then we present that to you at one of your meetings for your review. And, and we'll go through that in, in detail with you and then you have the chance to make edits, comments, ask questions, uh, what have you. Uh, from there, we go to a public comment period. We file the rules with uh, the Texas Register for a 30-day public comment period. The public gets to weigh in at that point, or industry, any interested parties. Then we come back to you after that at, at another meeting and present the rules again to you with all the public comments and give you a chance to make a final recommendation on that to our commission and then our commission uh, ultimately will make the decision on whether to adopt those rules or not. So we're going to be going through that process with you in the coming months uh, pretty heavily because we're in, in, in onboarding a new program. That's, that's a big part of it, getting the rules uh, kind of in shape and, and uh, in, in a TDLR uh, format. So um, just a couple more uh, points, uh, some uh, highlights of where where we've, uh, we excel, uh, when we uh, transferred, when we had 13 programs transferred to TDLR in recent years, we were able to trim the word count of those rules by about 45%. We want to streamline rules as much as we can, apply plain talk principles, use plain language as much as we can in those rules, uh, and we hope to do that working with, with your programs and with your rules uh, as well. Um, Right now, just to kind of give you a sense of our workload from the last legislative session, so far in this fiscal year, we, we've adopted uh, 18 rules. Our commission has adopted 18 uh, rule packages. Uh, we have 12 that are out for proposal that haven't been adopted yet, and a total of 31 uh, rules that are under some stage of development, still working their way uh, through the process. Another uh, function that we do is open records. We respond to open records requests, and uh, we have some statistics there for you. We do thousands of these uh, every year, and uh, we're, we're making an effort to try to put more information onto our website, 
to try to make sure people can get that information without necessarily having to file an open records request as much as we can. Uh, that's about all I have for you. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer that, and I look forward to, to working with all of you. So I'd like to thank all my division staff for their presentations. I'm going to take some executive privilege to summarize uh, the division presentations here in B because uh, the first groups didn't get an opportunity for the questions. If there's any questions related to customer service, education, examination, division, actually any of the divisions that are here, now's the time or is a good time to ask. We want to keep them general because we do know there's an FMQ meeting coming later where y'all get into the details. Is there anything that y'all didn't have answered, anything that's come up as y'all are going through the conversations? Y'all are drinking from a fire hose. There is light at the end of the tunnel, all right? So we're going to be keeping you probably till 11 o'clock or close to there, and then we'll give you a break. Mary's got about 10 minutes listed on hers. I think she'll probably stick to it. But just know that there is some light at the end of the tunnel, and we'll be around for questions during the break as well. So thank you for your patience. Good morning, Mary Winston. I, I guess I could be offended. I think I've been told like 20 times this morning. Stick to 10 minutes. No more than 10 minutes. I'm sticking to 10 minutes. Okay, good morning, everybody. I am Mary Winston, and I'm one of the attorneys in the Office of Strategic Communications. Part of my duties include manager of the advisory board support team and our new anti-trafficking unit, or as our um, executive director has recently described us as first identifiers in the fight against human trafficking. So today, uh, on our agenda, it says that we're supposed to talk about work group, member roles and responsibilities, and then the anatomy of a work group meeting. So what does that mean? Senate Bill 2119 of the 86th legislative session says that the purpose of the motor fuel stakeholder work group um, is to provide an input, advice, recommendations to the Department of Licensing and Regulation uh, and the Department of Agriculture on the orderly transfer of powers, duties, functions, programs, and activities related to motor fuel quality and metering program. The Transportation Code, Chapter 662.001, announced that or created the Motorcycle Advisory Board whose purpose is to advise the Commission on licensing and regulation and the Department on rules and educational and technical matters relevant to the administration of this chapter. So what does that mean? I've given you the legalese. What does that mean? I like to say it means that your jobs are to teach and learn or learn and teach. What are you teaching? You're teaching us how the statute and the rules work well, could work better, how best we can work with your industries as an agency, as a commission. What are you learning? You're learning the processes of the commission, of the department, and how we can collaboratively work together for the betterment of each of the industries, for the licensees and for Texans, right? That's what we're here for. Anatomy of a work group. It, within your packet, we are holding our first uh, motor fuel quality meeting this afternoon. And in the packet, we have a sample of an agenda. And this is pretty close to what most agendas look like. We try to keep everything the same until it has to be differently. So we try to stick with a template or a form as much as that works. And then for specifics, we deviate therefrom. You'll have call to order, roll call. Public comment. Public comment is when anyone comes in, they fill out forms that they want to make a comment. And public comment, as you know, this is being broadcast. All of our meetings are broadcast on YouTube. So those comments are heard with, within our building and throughout the, the internet. Um, and we have folks that sometimes want to make public comments for one minute, sometimes want to make comments for five minutes, 20 minutes. 
the presiding officer of that board or that work group can limit those public comments, and typically they do, to about three minutes per comment. Those comments are not part of the agenda, which has had to be filed timely to give the public notice of the meeting. So the items that are discussed on public comment are not up for discussion within the meeting. Clarifying questions may be asked, for instance, if there's something more clear, you're not quite understanding what they're getting at. But other than that, those items can be taken up at a later time. But the public does have time to speak. That later date could be at a time where it's another official meeting, we could have a summit or some other matter to handle whatever issue if we feel it needs to go further than a public comment. You'll have staff reports from the various staff and divisions like you've seen here. Uh, what are our numbers? What's been going on in the program? Licensing, enforcement, regulatory program management. Our executive office will give reports. Customer service if it's applicable. Then um, today, uh, within our next meeting, our actual first work group meeting, we have discussion and appointment of advisory groups. Within our boards, we typically call them work groups. Um, but those are just names that we come up with. They're sub-teams to take on larger, broader topics because we don't want to call you in here every couple of weeks. We're paying you a wonderful salary of zero and you're spending your own money to get here and we appreciate you so much. So these work groups that we have on smaller topics are typically held by phone call. You can come in if you'd like to. Um, we do have some sort of smart board efforts if we can get there, depending on which group is meeting. And those things that will be discussed, for instance, today enforcement work group will be uh, put together and they'll discuss criminal conviction guidelines, penalty matrix, and enforcement related matters. That's just a sample. They'll have licensing work groups where a topic will be discussed in that work group and the findings of that work group will be brought back to the larger body. How do we do these things? Uh, of course, we always have rules, uh, and our general counsel just talked about when the rules come to you, how that's presented, how, it's go how it goes out for public comment, and how it comes back with those public comments for the advisory groups to take into consideration before they move those rules forward. We have recommendations for new items, and then we discuss the next meeting time and place. Finally, how do we do this? We have uh, three program specialists currently. We have Anna Clark, Angelica Lopez-Sparks, and Delia Luna. They are your first points of contacts. Collectively, we are advisory.boards at tdlr.texas.gov because we all get those emails. But each of these individuals is tasked with a specific number of boards that they are first responders to, and we have backup. Uh, and we all back each other up. We currently have 33 boards, councils, work groups, and we have about 270, I think it's 269 members. And you're all over Texas and from outside of Texas. So we, we heard a lot of folks in, and these ladies are very patient. They offer excellent customer service, and we're here to serve. If you have any questions, please let me know. We are available by phone. Our numbers are in your binders. We're available via email, individually or collectively as advisory.boards. And I'm available for about three more minutes if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So, as we've gone through the agenda, you see the division presentations are divided by functional alignment. That's how we get our business done here at TDLR. There wasn't a presentation from the motor fuels group or the motorcycles group. We have expertise in each of the divisions depending on what the aspects of the program involve. Motorcycles, education and examination is probably going to be your go-to if there's some subject matter expertise that's necessary. FMQ. Could be Charlotte's group with a lot of the stuff if it's skimmers related and it's early in the process, but if it's on the enforcement side, it may be on our enforcement division. 
Our work is done through the collaboration, and I think our education examination director said it best, that there's a melding and a gel that has to happen for all these presentations to happen and everybody feel like, okay, there's a connection there. There's something that we're doing. Field inspections to enforcement, RPM to enforcement, licensing, customer service to licensing, all those things have to happen because of the relationships we developed and those points of contact. It's not an easy job, not with 39 programs, we appreciate the patience and the enthusiasm y'all bring because we feed off the energy y'all provide. We've got some advisory boards that are very well participated in. There's big crowds that show up. Our cosmetology group is the largest licensing group. There's usually an audience here letting us know how they feel. That's what we need from you guys. And again, we don't pay y'all. Um, y'all are doing this on y'all's own time. So we appreciate the time y'all are spending, the enthousi enthusiasm y'all bring, the ideas y'all bring. We want to hear them. It makes our jobs easier. It makes us more effective. We need y'all's input. So thank you for your time. I'm going to cut us off a little bit early. Uh, oh, yes, sir. Could I just say something before you cut us off? Sure. Can you hear me all right with this thing? I don't know. Yes, just, you're doing great. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, I, I travel quite a bit now, and I don't know if it's the leadership of this actual um, organization or not. But I can tell you that not one person out there has fallen asleep. <laughs> um, you have been very attentive. Now, Ron, a little concerned about you because you have not stopped smiling <laughs> since we got here. But that's okay. Um, I tried to put on a nice face. It's the nicest people it's, it's that still you, there. you don't yes. want to meet. Um, but, but I am very Im impressed with the professionalism of, of you guys as a leadership staff of this organization. And that, that gives me hope that something good will, will come out of this. And I didn't fly here from Maine for nothing, even though it is warm and I love Texas. And, and the only other thing I'd like to say is my, my prior life, um, like Adam, I was in law enforcement. And you should be so damn proud, so proud for not being afraid to talk about human trafficking. The last five years of my career, I did nothing but investigate sexual exploitation cases. So kudos to you. You are like the, the leading edge in this country. Um, I, I really, really appreciate that. And not that I have any expertise, but if you have any questions, I've probably <laughs> dealt with it before. And I do have one question that you can probably answer. I hope um, so. Whoever put this notebook together, please thank them for me personally, uh, if they're not in here. Um, I'm, I know it wasn't any of you, but somebody did. <laughs> uh, the, the only thing that's not in, how many employees do you actually have? About 20,000 or? I'm going to say 500 plus because it's always in flux. We've got some people that are coming on board, still some positions to hire, but 500 plus employees. We're a small agency with large responsibilities. and so over 800,000 licensees in our uh, responsibility level. It's a lot per person to have to handle. So thank you for the kind words. Uh, well, and, that, that, and I'm done with them. I mean, I won't give you any more, but. <laughs> <laughs> also the acknowledgement of the human trafficking because, because of our role in licensing and regulation, we are in a unique position to have an effect and to aid law enforcement with things like this. And it is a se severe situation in Texas and other places as well. So we're glad to have some opportunity to, to provide some insight on that. Any other questions? Thank you for that. You traveled a long way and offered some great wisdom for us. Thank you. That's it. That's all I got. <laughs> all right. So bathrooms are around the corner from the elevators. There's some snacks and refreshments that the same staff that put together these notebooks for <coughs> put out there for you. So make sure and uh, make use of them. And we're breaking till 11:15, I think. Thank you all very much.
They know all about it. So we've got two screens. They are not the 85 inch screens. We haven't gotten that big yet, but hopefully everybody can see that one. Probably the best quality. One of these two screens should be available uh, for the presentation. There will be some text up there that you might need to see and look at. So we appreciate y'all's attention to that. So we are getting assistance today. Uh, this is actually the regular job for all the advisory boards uh, from our general, assistant general counsel. Every advisory board is required to go through this training. Um, Mr. Derek Burkhalter will be providing training today. Uh, and so please give him your attention, and we will move forward with our uh, Administrative Procedures Act training. Thank you, Dave. Uh, sure. oh. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? So my name is Derek Burkhalter. I am an assistant general counsel with TDLR, and I will be assigned to the motorcycle safety group. So I'll, I'll be working with you all in the future to um, develop our rules and uh, those, ki those kinds of things. Um, so myself and my colleagues, Jessica Escobar and Mark Gladney, are going to present um, this open government training to you. Um, let me start by asking all of you, has anyone here served on a governmental uh, board or commission of any kind before? Raise your hand if you have. So we've got one, so we've got, it looks like three people. Okay, so it may be, this may be familiar to you all, but it may be totally new to everyone else. So, um, you know, first of all, I want to thank you all for volunteering to, um, to act in this role. It's a very valuable service you're providing to the state of Texas. Um, and you're not receiving much in return, and you are, um, you are exposing yourself to a set of laws that apply to you in your official capacity, not just while you're in the meetings for TDLR, but also when you're in the public interacting with other people. Um, you have to be conscious, um, conscientious of these laws and make sure that you're not doing anything to violate them because it could have effects on the agency and in, as you'll see, it could have uh, consequences for you as an individual. So we, we will be looking at three sort of sets of laws. These are each uh, separate chapters in the Texas Government Code. The Administrative Procedure Act, which is um, basically governs our rulemaking function. The Public Information Act, which governs open records requests. And the Open Meetings Act, which governs the laws surrounding the meetings that we have and your ability to, to discuss uh, official business. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to start with the Administrative Procedure Act. And so this, like I said, this is the um, chapter in the government code that um, sort of sets the rules and the processes for the rulemaking function for every agency in the state of Texas. Now, I want to start off by making sure we all understand the difference between a rule and a statute. So a statute is the actual law that is passed by the Texas legislature. So it, you know, those are the provisions that you see in the different codes, um, the transportation code, the occupation code. Those are all laws that were passed by the legislature. Um, and oftentimes, the legislature will pass a law saying, um, we want to delegate power to a specific state agency to govern a program such as motor fuels or motorcycle safety. And we're going to leave it to an agency like TDLR to come up with the rules that govern those programs. Um, so a lot of times the legislature doesn't want to dig in too deep to the details. They kind of delegate it to the state agency to work with the experts, who are you guys, to decide what are the appropriate standards for those industries. And so when we talk about rules, we're talking about the, eight, the standards that are developed by these state agencies as opposed to the statutes that were passed by the Texas legislature. So when you hear the term statutory, statute, we're talking about laws, but when you hear rules, or sometimes we'll call them regulations, we're talking about the, the agency uh, standards. So um, a common theme that you'll see in all, of these, um, in all of these chapters is transparency and opportunity for public participation. 
And here at TDLR, we really embrace those principles and we sometimes go above and beyond what the actual requirements are <coughs> and um, we, you know, we do extra to make sure that the public knows what we're doing. Um, our licensees know how the standards that apply to them are being developed. You know, it's not just some backroom deals going on. We want it to be very open. We want the public to be very engaged and to have many opportunities to provide feedback and um, criticism if necessary. So the Texas Administrative Procedure Act, um, the, the purpose is to establish minimum standards of uniform practice and procedure for state agencies and to provide, as I said, public participation and transparency during the rulemaking process. Now, um, this kind of, this may cover what I've already said, but when we're talking about a rule, you know, again, this is state agency standards. Um, it's a statement made by a state agency that implements, interprets, or prescribes a law or a policy. Or, oh, that's, um, so a rule would also describe the procedure or practice requirements of a state agency. So anytime we're talking about state agency policy that would apply to the general public, um, we have to go through um, the rulemaking process. Um, we can't just sort of have arbitrary standards out there. If it's uh, a standard that applies to the public, it has to go through this specific process. And a rule is a statement of general applicability. So if we're just dealing with one licensee who has a particular issue, we don't have to pass a rule to, to deal with that individual. But if it applies to the general public or to a general licensee population, then uh, it's generally applicable and we would need a rule for that purpose. So a rule is not just creating new rules, it's also any time we amend or repeal a rule that already exists. And I should also say that our uh, rules passed by state agencies, they're contained in the Texas Administrative Code and that is a separate sort of code that contains all of the different rules passed by each state agency throughout the state and it's maintained by the Secretary of State's office. So a rule, as I said, does not, so, well, I guess I haven't covered this. The rule, a rule does not solely relate to internal management or organization of a state agency. So a rule applies to the general public, but if it only involves internal agency functions, like how we run our divisions or things like that, we don't have to have rules for those. That's kind of an internal management function, and we can do those things on our own, except to the extent that they affect the rights of the public. And so that's kind of a, an important distinction to make. So whenever we look at creating rules or amending rules or repealing them, um, the ideas for those things can come from many different sources. Sometimes it's a legislative change. Sometimes the legislature will change the law that applies to your program, and it requires us to change our rules to to fit that, that change to the statute. And we can, all, we can only create rules that are within the power that the legislature grants us. So we can't just make a, a rule about anything. We are restricted to the actual power that the legislature has delegated to us. And so we look, we look to the statute to see what they are. The statute says sometimes TDLR can pass a rule concerning continuing education. So that allows us to then develop rules concerning continuing education. So we have to stick within the framework that the legislature provides for us in the statutes. Sometimes our rules will come from you guys in advisory board work groups. We depend on you to tell us how the industry is affected by what we do. And so that's why it's so important for us to have these meetings with you because we need to hear from you. We need, if you have ideas as to how to make things better, we need to hear those because we can adapt our processes um, using that information from you. Um, advisory board discussions during official meetings, sometimes good rulemaking ideas will come from that. Um, sometimes public comments at those meetings will spark something in our heads that, hey, we need to address that situation. Um, sometimes um, people within the agency will come up with a good idea for a rule. And so sometimes um, our staff are very important people to look to because they, they, they kind of see how 
the sausage is made and we can identify ways to make things more efficient or lighten the burden on, on licensees or things like that. And then uh, the Administrative Procedure Act also requires that for each program, every four years, we have to look to see if our rules are still necessary and just to see if they're still relevant and um, if, you know, if we should keep them, basically. So if we do nothing throughout four years, we still, at the end of that four-year period, have to look at our rules totally and decide, do we need to change them? Do these rules still need to exist? You know, so it's, it's kind of a, an internal mechanism to make sure that we review everything on a periodic basis. And then any interested person in the public can file a rule petition with an agency and w with their ideas. So, um, and actually let me cover that right here. So any interested person may submit a petition to a state agency requesting the adoption of a rule. Um, so what is an interested person? So that could be a Texas resident, it could be a business entity located in Texas, a governmental subdivision, like a governmental agency in Texas, or a public or private organization that is not a state agency but is located in Texas. So kind of the common theme here is in Texas. Basically any person in Texas is an interested party. So any person in Texas can file a petition with an agency saying, hey, I think you guys need to adopt this rule. And then we are then required to look at that proposal, um, consider it, analyze it, and decide if that's something that should be done. And then we would either, if we decide it is something that should be done, we would begin a rulemaking process to, to adopt that uh, proposal. Or if we decide, no, this is not something we want, we want to do, um, we would have to give a written justification for why we did not feel that it was a good thing to do. So this slide is going to sort of give you a, a summary of, of the rulemaking process as required by the Administrative Procedure Act. Um, so first we start with an idea for a rule, which can come from many of those different sources that we saw before. And then we take that idea and we kind of come up with a first draft of a rule and kind of, you know, kind of our first shot at what should this rule look like, how do we put this concept into words. And then once staff has that sort of first draft, then we will take that draft to the advisory board for consideration. So this is kind of the first time that you guys would get involved. Often we will involve you in, the, in that first step of, of com coming up with the first draft. We may have you subdivided into a smaller work group that doesn't meet a quorum, so it's not an official meeting, and uh, Mark will talk more about that later. Um, but a work group may help us sit down with staff to determine the actual language of our first draft. And then once we have that, as I said, we would take it to the full advisory board at a public meeting um, to let you guys kind of consider what this first draft, you know, what are the effects on the industry, what are your ideas, what are your thoughts, what, are, what is your feedback. And then um, if you say, yeah, we like this rule, we, we vote to approve it, then the next step is we're going to file this proposed rule with the Texas Register. Now, the Texas Register is a weekly public publication. The um, Texas Secretary of State's office um, maintains the Texas Register. And so every week they publish um, all the different state agencies that have different rule proposals or are adopting new rules. It goes into this publication that the, the general public can access. And so it's another way for the public to stay informed. And then after we file this rule proposal in the Texas Register, the public has 30 days to, to provide comment. And um, this is a written comment period, and so they can submit written comments to an email address, they can mail them in, there are many different ways um, to, for the public to send us those comments. But this is another opportunity for public participation um, to give us feedback. And at the end of that 30-day period, we take all of the comments we've received and the general counsel's office um, sits down and we review each of those comments individually and one by one we go through them and we have to address each one. Sometimes they'll come in kind of in groups and we'll, we'll get 50 people kind of saying the same thing so we can kind of lump those together and address them as one. But we do have to read each single um, 
comment that comes in and the agency has to address you know, whether we think that's a good idea. Sometimes we'll actually change our draft of the rule based on these comments. We'll say, hey, these people are bringing up a really good point. We didn't consider that before. But now that we have the benefit of that public comment, we can kind of make changes to, to accommodate the feedback. And so once we have, once general counsel has done that job of going through all the comments, um, then we, you know, maybe we, we maybe we've made changes to the rules based on those, and we would so we would bring the changes or, or the first draft with no changes back to your to your advisory board, um, and along with that we would bring a recommendation. We would we would basically provide you a summary of all the public comments. You know, we don't require you to hear each individual one. We just kind of provide a general summary, and give you a general idea of how we're proposing to respond to those comments. And then at that point, this is kind of your second look at the rule proposal. Um, and if you like it, then you can vote to send it to the commission to be adopted. And so I should kind of explain here that the commission is the governing body of TDLR. Um, you, the role that you're playing is an advisory position. So you're not actually passing these rules for TDLR but you are advising us and you're providing a recommendation to the commission and the commission would be the body that would actually adopt the rule. They would vote to, to adopt the rule. And so at this second sort of look that you guys have, um, if you approve the rule, if you like it, then you would vote to recommend adoption to the commission. And if you don't like it, if you, if you do not vote to adopt it or to recommend adoption, then we could send it back and kind of start the process all over. But assuming that you do recommend adoption by the commission, um, we would then have a, uh, present the rule at a commission meeting, and we would provide the commissioners with a brief summary of the rule and your recommendations and public comments. And um, at that point, the commission would decide whether they want to adopt the rule, or sometimes they don't, they don't feel comfortable with it. Um, sometimes we get public comments at the meeting, and commissioners may not feel um, completely comfortable with a particular rule, so they have the ability to kind of stop the process there as well. And so assuming the commission votes to adopt the rule, we would then file the final rule language again with the Texas Register to give the public notice that this rule is about to go into effect. And so again, it would be filed with the Texas Register so anyone in the public can see. And then 20 days after we file it with the Texas Register, then it becomes, it, it takes effect. It becomes adopted 20 days later. We also have the ability to set a later effective date. So for like the motorcycle rules, we may adopt those in July and set the effective date for September 1st. But you can't do it earlier than the 20 days. Okay, so I mentioned that we have a four-year rule review requirement. So this is just gonna kind of walk you through that process a little bit. Um, so we get to the end of the four-year period, and we know we have to review all of our rules. Um, we actually file a notice of intent to review in the Texas Register, so the public knows that we are going through this process. Um, this gives the public 30 days to provide public comments. They can write in and tell us, like, these rules aren't necessary, the industry doesn't need them anymore, or these are the changes that we see that you need to make to your rules. At the end of that 30-day public comment period, the General Counsel's Office would review all of those comments and um, use those to identify things that need to be changed or rules that need to be repealed, and we would uh, formulate a recommendation that would go to the Commission. Um, the Commission would review the rule, the rule filing, all the comments that are received, and it would choose to readopt the rule or readopt it with changes or possibly even repeal some of the rules. And the advisory board would also be included in this process and would be presented the public comments, and they would be also be allowed to weigh in on this decision. So um, that kind of concludes the substance of my presentation. Um, there are some additional resources if, if you're interested and want to learn more about this. The Attorney General's Office has a really good handbook that they have avail available on their website. And um, these references should be in your printed material. 
Um, if you want to see the text of the law itself, this is in the Texas Government Code in chapters 2001, 2006, and 2007. Um, you can find a lot of information on the Secretary of State, State's website. And again, they maintain the Texas Register and the Texas Administrative Code. And finally, if you have any questions, you can always feel free to call our office. And this number should also be in your printed materials. So with that, um, does anybody have any questions on the Administrative Procedure Act? Just what, real quick, uh, just in general, how many rules for any given program where you all have to review every four years? How many rules are involved? In well, so we have uh, something like 40 programs. Um, e each of those programs has its own chapter within the Texas Administrative Code. Depending on the complexity of that program, the number will vary. Um, some of our medical programs have rules that are there are probably, I, I don't know, dozens of rules long. Some of our more less complex programs will have, say, a set of 10 rules. But um, you know, each rule will, will also be a varying length. Sometimes a rule will, be, will fit on one page, and sometimes a single rule will take uh, five or six pages. So just depending on the complexity of the program, um, it would vary. And I saw a question over here. So if uh as the advisory board makes a recommendation to pass a rule to the commission and they reject it, does it die there or does it come back to the advisory board to rework or? It, it, well, it would kind of start the process over again. Um, so it, w it would kind of go back to the work group. So we would, we would um, and w we will divide you up, as I, said, as I said, into work groups. And so if it concerns a licensing issue, we would send it to the licensing work group. and. They would take the commission's feedback and kind of maybe adjust the language to address those concerns of the commissioners. And then we would have to start the process all over again. So if we change the language, we would have to, again, publish and let the public, let the, let the public comment on that proposal and kind of start the process over. But it doesn't end the efforts. I mean, you can still push your idea forward, but maybe just make a few modifications to help the commissioners become comfortable. And, and Brad has. Uh, we would be guided by whatever feedback we get from the commission and typically in that situation it's going to be a very specific issue or question that comes up and most of the time it would be sent back to the advisory board that's been our experience to, to take a look at Derek first of all great job man this is the bulk of the work you're going to be doing and particularly on the front end of this process you're going to be knee-deep in rules uh, so <coughs> understanding that the way we have set it up, there is a lot of transparency involvement of the public. So you get to weigh in, you're going to see the draft on the front end, and you're going to like, oh my God, that's ridiculous. Oh, this is brilliant. This is wonderful. And have those dialogues with us. Uh, then the, co the public's going to weigh in. And they're going to say, I don't know what those folks on the advisory board are thinking. Because uh, that, that's not how it works in the real world. And you're going to get their comments. Uh, one of the examples I always use is with the, um, the licensed breeder program. It's one of our smaller programs, 175 licensees, maybe 182 on a given day. When we did their first rule package, we received over 10,000 comments. That's insane. That was more comments than we had received for our 25 programs going back for the last 15 years together. We had to read every comment in that process. Our general counsel's office, along with RPM and those folks, had to respond, you know, have a, a response, not to the individual. We didn't go to their door and say, we're now responding to your comment, but, you know, following the, uh, the process. Um, you know, Terry, with the uh, podiatry program, and I'm going to be a little bit off on the numbers, but their rules in terms of words had 35,000 words. <coughs> and when we went through our TDLR process, uh, we put it on the keto diet, whatever diet you want to call it, <laughs> um, and we trimmed it down to about 11,000 words. We did not change the scope of practice for a podiatrist, how they touch the patient. We just took out the, the government speaking. I was talking to the guys over about that. We took out the things that didn't need to be there for several reasons. One, if you're thinking about TDLR and every rule that's out there while you're doing your job, then we're not doing ours. We should not be involved in your day to day. But the more we free up the things off your plate, the more it frees up things off our plate. We get to narrow down to those items 
that Ron was talking about are really, really consumer harm related matters. Not the general, oh, this, this is an issue I want to. So if anyone, and I think I saw they were checked on the outside of the door, if anyone came in with an ax to grind, oh, I want this one thing, this is not an ax grinding room. We, we don't do that here. We do public policy. We do good, effective public policy. We don't write rules to keep one competitor out of a business over another competitor. We write rules to make sure the process is fair and that it's predictable. That's what business people want. They want a predictable environment that they can operate in. This is going to be your life for the next six months. You're going to be looking at rules, and you need to really drill down, bring your Webster next to you, bring your thesaurus, uh, bring your synonyms, and say, does that word shall in here, should it be there? Because if we put shall in there, then we may take an enforcement action because the person didn't do the shall. Should they lose their license, their livelihood, their opportunity to engage in that business because we put that rule in there? Because it felt good, like everybody should do this. Not everybody should do your business practice. That's why it's your business practice. But what is the minimum? What's the minimum safety requirement that should impact the whole state? So as you start going through these rules, really look at the words may and shall. Every rule in there could potentially be an opportunity for somebody to lose their livelihood. And that's how serious you need to take us uh, when you go through this process. I think Derek did a fantastic job of walking through the public comment, the opportunity to engage, uh, the transparency. Uh, you're going to be seeing, you're going to be like, you're going to be translucent. This process will be so transparent um, <laughs> to the point that after you leave your second meeting, you know, Jude, they're going to come up to you and say, Jude, I saw you on TV, and I don't know why you said that stupid thing about that rule. I mean, we're going to open you up uh, to the public engagement, but that's what, that's what government should do. It should be a dialogue. It should be a debate, debate and a deliberation so we have the very best rules that come out of this process. So, Derek, fantastic job, man. And great hair. Oh, thank you. Prove <laughs> <laughs> somebody who knows. <laughs> Were there any more questions about the, the Administrative Procedure Act? Okay, thank you for your attention, and I will now pass it over to Jessica Escobar. Thank you. So I will be brief. Um, I have a lot less to talk about than Derek did, so I am briefly going to talk about the um, Public Information Act. I'm just going to get those up there, so I'm not going to go through that. So let's start here. So have any of you all actually submitted a public inform information request to a state or local agency? I think probably some of y'all actually have. So have you, as a licensee, are you aware that any public information requests have been put in on y'all? I'm looking at probably you guys. So you may not know, because you may not know that actually one went through. So the Public Information Act makes all documents, records, and other information that a governmental body that um, maintains available to the public. So we'll, we'll talk about this later, but pretty much everything that we have TD at TDLR minus our skimmer reports, is going to be public information. So that means emails, um, reports, enforcement documents, which other stuff. Um, all of that is going to be available to the public. And so they can put in those requests for open records to us, and that's available to them. So of course, there are going to be certain exceptions that apply. And so there are a lot of different exceptions that apply. And we're not going to get into those. But what the bottom line you need to know is that public information is out there. Um, and this includes electronic communication. So anything that is maintained on any device, if that communication is maintained for official business, is available to the public. So here at TDLR, Open Records is part of the Office of General Counsel, um, which is where, where I work. And so we track and receive all requests um, at the department, and that is all done with a staff of one attorney, Mia Settle, who handles all of that, and three legal assistants. So last fiscal year, we had almost 7,400 open records requests. That is a lot of requests. And so they do all of that. That can range from anything just wanting to know about licensees to wanting to know information on enforcement outcomes. Um, so there's just any number of things that a person can request open records on. Um, and so for us, we have an obligation to respond quickly. So by statute, what Derek was talking about, we have an obligation to respond to any open records request 
within 10 business days. So for us, if, if we get something within staff, within the Open Records Division, we have to respond within 10 days. Um, if we get outside of that, we've got we've to pursue it and, and work with the requester, but we make it our obligation and our goal to respond really quickly. So the purpose of, of public information is transparency, of course. If the, if the public wants to know what's, what's, in the, what's out there, um, we want to be able to comply and provide that to them. So that is it in a nutshell. I'm trying to get you guys back on track and get you to lunch. So do you guys have any questions for me? Um, no? And I will see the, you guys later today. So if you have anything, feel free to stop me. And I will. Um, we, of course, have some resources for you all. There's a great video online at the Texas Attorney General's office. It is an hour long, but it has fantastic information. If you wanted to know how to put in a public information request, um, learn about the exceptions, learn about what is available to the public, you can do that. We have that in uh, your materials, I believe. Um, and you can, you can certainly do that. It's available to the public, this one hour training. Um, there's also a handbook, it's very long. Um, and then you can always, of course, call us and we're happy to help you. So I will pass it on to Mark and get you back on track. Good morning. My name is Mark Lightney. I'm an assistant general counsel with the general counsel's office for TDLR. And uh, I was given basically two directives uh, today. Uh, the executive director said uh, be entertaining. I'm not entirely sure the subject matter lends itself to that, so I don't know if I'll succeed in that. And my, my other directive uh, from board support is to try to be as brief as possible, otherwise I'm going to be forced to run laps around uh, the building and I don't think I'll make one. So um, the subject I'll be talking about today is the Open Means Act. And the, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the um, the purpose of the Open Means Act, and um, you've heard the, the word transparency a number of times from a number of different people. Transparency is extremely important. That's uh, the whole basis behind the, the Open Means Act. What it is that you do, the, the executive director said that you are public uh, servants now, you, and you are. And what, um, whether it's a work group or it's a, um, a, uh, an advisory board, uh, the decisions that you're going to make, the, uh, the deliberations that you're going to be doing, uh, the purpose of the Open Meetings Act is to make sure that uh, it is open and transparent government to the public so they know exactly what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it, when we're doing it, that it is, it is you're working for them. We, we all work for them. And that's the purpose of the, uh, the Open Meetings Act. Um, uh, of course, the act requires that the means uh, be open to the public and, and proceed by notice of the time, place, and subject matter that you all are going to be uh, deliberating over and, and, and talking about. Um, the provisions of the act are mandatory, uh, so you, you must follow these things. Um, Derek discussed very briefly about uh, what a quorum is, and a quorum is a, a majority of the members uh, of the, the advisory board or committee or work group as fixed by rule or statute. So uh, for the purposes here, the, the uh, um, uh, the motor fuels group, there's about 15 of y'all, so it'd be a majority uh, of y'all, so if my math's correct, I guess that'd be eight. Uh, the um, uh, motorcycle group is nine, so a, a quorum would be five. Yeah. Um, and a quorum of a governmental body must be present uh, in order to, to take any official action on an item that is um, uh, on the agenda. Now, if a quorum isn't present, um, you can discuss an item on the agenda, but you can't take any official action associated with that, that item. Oops. Okay, um, some of the elements of the uh, Open Means Act. Um, deliberation. Uh, deliberation or discussion. Uh, it means any kind of verbal or, or written exchange uh, amongst uh, the work group or the, um, the advisory board concerning an issue, issue that's within the jurisdiction of either the work group or the advisory board. So uh, if, it's, if it's motorcycle, uh, the motorcycle advisory board, it's, it's those items that uh, uh, are germane to what uh, the, um, uh, the statute and the rules say that the, the motorcycle advisory board or the motor fuels uh, work group uh, covers. So 
uh, that those type of subjects or issues are what the Open Means Act covers. Okay, another element is uh, what is a meeting? A meeting occurs any time that there's a quorum, so a majority of the group engages in any kind of discussion regarding the public business or public policy over which either the work group or the uh, advisory board has uh, jurisdiction, supervisor, or control, or any time that the, the body takes action. Okay. <laughs> 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 Ready to go. <laughs> okay. Um, another important point uh, with regard to open and transparent government is notice. Uh, the Open Means Act requires that the written notice of the date, 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 time, place, and subject of each meeting be put out there. And the way that TDLR does it is in the form of an agenda. And I'm sure you've seen it. There's agendas over there. And um, notice must be filed with the, the uh, Secretary of State at least seven days prior uh, to the meeting and, and must be posted online. Uh, and they're posted online with, uh, on our website and with the Secretary of State. Uh, now, this is an important thing. Um, a board, committee, work group may not engage in discussions about a subject not included in the agenda. So think of the agenda as a roadmap. You have to stay within the four corners of that roadmap. It's your destination. So if you've got 10 items on there, you're going from whatever, A to whatever it is, I. You, that's, that's your roadmap. The job of general counsel is to be based on your travel guides. Yeah. So we make sure that you stay within the four corners of, that, of, of your roadmap and, and, and stick to the, the items that are uh, and the subject matter that's on the agenda. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's some questions that come up um, related to uh, the Open Means Act. What if you find yourself in a social function, conventions, or workshop? Um, now, knowing that a meeting occurs when there's a quorum of you that engages in discussion um, about an issue within your jurisdiction, whether it's a work group or, or the uh, advisory board, <coughs> Uh, can you ever meet in, a, in informal set, uh, settings, you know, like conventions and things of that nature, and discuss things? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, members are free to discuss engaging conversation that's incidental to the event that you happen to be attending, you know, convention or whatever it may be. However, the gathering would be subject to the Open Meetings Act if a quorum of the members is present and the members e either engage in a discussion about board, uh, work group, or, or um, uh, committee business or take final action or formal action so you you can do it but you've got to be extremely careful about what it is that you engage in discussion about <clears throat> okay key points to remember these are the pro tips these, these are things that you really really should pay attention to and I may repeat them and I'm repeating them because they are extremely important you need to always be aware of your surroundings. You always need to be aware of any situation occurring outside of a meeting, a noticed meeting, in which a quorum of members is present, or you think there may be a quorum of members present. Don't engage in any uh, substantive conversations relating to the board, work group, uh, committee business, or policy when there is a quorum of, of you present and you're outside of an officially noticed and scheduled meeting. Yeah. Um, the big pro tip that I always like to talk about is basically the best thing for you to do is conduct your business within here, within a, an officially noticed and scheduled meeting. You can conduct business there. That's the safest thing that you can possibly do. And the last thing, beware of the walking quorum. <coughs> and Ray Pizarro of E&E has &E is, is, is told me, you know, make sure that you, you really emphasize this, this particular point on a walking quorum. Okay, <clears throat> a walking quorum occurs when fewer than a quorum of members engage in a discussion about official business and then talk about those discussions with other members. Okay, now, while it's fewer than a quorum uh, participating in that first conversation, subsequent communication with other members of either the work group or the advisory board um, can result in a quorum discussing official business outside of the confines of a public meeting. That is a big, big
big, big no-no. Okay. Here's an example. Uh, you got a five-member advisory board, or let's just use the motorcycle folks. It's a nine-member advisory board. And um, a couple of members exchange uh, phone calls and emails expressing thoughts about uh, an item um, that's within your, your jurisdiction or control. And um, maybe you all did a little bit of research. So two of you, two of you guys were uh, talking about this. And one of the um, board members in that discussion forwards that to somebody else. So you're at three. And then that person s s transmits that information to another one and another one. And pretty soon you're at five. Okay. Uh, at that point, you've engaged in a walking corner um, by engaging in a small group discussion outside a properly noticed board meeting. That is something that you got to stay away from. No if ands, or buts about it. You must stay away from that. You know, again, if you want to do any, any business that's related to your work group or your board, do it again you know, with a properly noticed meeting. It's easy to do. It's easy to get away with. You know, so you've got to be careful. Now, walking in quorums can occur in any number of situations. And with today's technology, it's even easier to do it. It's easy to fall in that trap. Got to be careful. So walking in quorums can occur during conference calls, uh, video conferences, hallway discussions, uh, email, text, and, and other technology. And the other, by other technology, we're talking about social media. So if y'all you all got Facebook pages or, or Twitter pages, and other members of the advisory group or work group are, are, are your friends and they're following that and you start discussing items uh, that uh, are, are either things that you're going to be talking about or, or stuff that um, is, is on your, your, your plate uh, and within the jurisdiction and control of the, the board or the work group, you can violate quorum, you know, you can do a walking quorum just like that, just instantly just typing it in and clicking and you've just communicated to the entire, uh, the entire work group or the entire uh, advisory board. Don't do that. I can't stress it enough. Don't do that. Okay. Okay. So these are the best practices. The, the pro tips we like to give to avoid a walking quorum. Uh, members shouldn't meet in small groups. Discuss board or community business. Um, and then communicate those discussions to other members. Uh, or send emails or texts to a quorum of members uh, regarding official business. Doesn't matter if the email is addressed to the members individually. So if you're thinking, oh, hey, I'll avoid this by just sending each one separate to these guys. No, don't do that. Yeah. <clears throat> Great posts on social media. Um, and we've, we've talked about why you can't, you can't do that. Uh, or Importantly here, ask a quorum of members, even on an individual basis, for feedback or comments on board or committee business outside of the public meeting. This is polling. Uh, again, that is a no-no. Okay. okay, here are some guidelines for open, open sessions. We talked about these previously, but I, I want to make sure that you <coughs> really, really understand. You're limited to talking to the specific items on the agenda. Remember, the agenda is your roadmap. Yeah. We are your travel guides. We, um, the Assistant General Counsel assigned to uh, a program, an advisory board or work group um, that's in an open uh, meeting setting. Uh, we will give you a little nudge. Uh, sometimes if you don't, um, you know, you continue to do it, then it might be uh, maybe a, a little harder nudge, and then maybe it might be just sort of a kick in the ankle and, and to get you back on track. So please, don't, just stay on, on topic. Okay. Now, uh, public comment was mentioned. We do allow uh, a, um, an item on the agenda for public comment. Public comment usually lasts about three minutes, and members of the public are given an opportunity to speak. Uh, however, you are not to respond to them outside of what Mary Winston talked about clarifying questions. Now, if, if during public comment somebody raises an issue that, that raises your antenna and you, you actually are interested in it, you can always suggest at the end of the agenda that that item 
uh, or that subject matter they talked about be placed on a future agenda. Okay. okay again, you know, we, we already discussed uh, the best practices. You see them here on your screen. They're in your, your materials as well. You know, again, you know, just stick to um, what the agenda says and don't discuss uh, items outside of the, uh, the confines of a, a properly noticed meeting. Um, and just stay on, stay on topic. Okay. Now this is important. Um, it wouldn't be really a, a, uh, a statute unless there were some penalties associated with it. Um, now, there, there can be civil rem remedies for violating the Open uh, Meetings Act, and uh, any interested person, including the media, can petition the court <coughs> to stop any uh, actions that are taken by um, a, a governmental body in violation of the act. <coughs> um, the act also states that the action taken in violation of the act is, is, is voidable. It's not necessarily void, but it's voidable. Okay. Importantly to you personally, I think Derek just brought this up. There, there are some, some penalties that can be associated to you personally for violating the Open Meetings Act. There's criminal penalties that are associated with a violation of the Open Meetings Act. Members who knowingly participate in a walking quorum or knowingly participate in a meeting that's close to the public can be subject to misdemeanor criminal penalties. The penalties can be a fine, um, confinement in the county jail up to one to six months or both. Okay? And that's not to say that 5-0 or Walker, Texas Ranger is going to come popping, you know, pounding down your door if, if you, you do it. But there are people out there that don't necessarily like regulation or don't like you know, everything that you all may do or want to do. And, you know, they may be looking for a reason to, to do something, to, to try to, to stop whatever it is that, that they disagree with. Following a complaint with law enforcement could be one way of doing it. So always be aware of where you are, what you're doing. Um, because there, there are some serious penalties associated with the violation of this act. Be very, very careful. Okay. And I've been told that my time is pretty much up. Uh, so, um, again, we, um, there's the best practices. Again, it's inside your binder. You can look at uh, some of those best practices. And uh, here's some resources. And one thing that I, I wholeheartedly recommend that you actually go take a look at, the, the Attorney General's Office has a great um, open meeting trainings information and video uh, that you can go and watch. I highly recommend that you go and watch that thing. And when you finish, you get yourself a little certificate uh, of completion suitable for framing. So um, <laughs> make sure that you, you, you take advantage of all that. And uh, again, they also have an open meetings handbook, and the, the government code chapter 551 covers open meetings if you're so inclined to look at the statute. And if you have any questions, um, um, there's our number uh, to the general counsel's office, and you know, we're, we're more than happy to talk with you. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we, we thought we'd end the, uh, the presentation on, on Halloween and kind of scare you a little bit <laughs> with the, the walking core. It's always spooky. Um, but it's part of being a public servant. Um, I think my motorcycle folks may fall into the, the opportunity for a walking core a little bit more than motor fields. Uh, but you're going to present yourselves in those moments. Um, if it's a conversation about agency business, uh, that, that's when it gets a little hairy. Well, you're going to run into it at the next task force meeting when uh, they say, hey, Ray, bring us an update on what the advisory board group's doing. Talk to our general counsel office. All we have to do is just post a meeting and saying there possibly be a quorum of folks here talking about agency business. We, we, we can cover those moments. Uh, at the next um, TFFA meeting, if TDOLR is on the agenda and I'm giving an update on this and we have you know, a majority or a quorum of our folks there, all we have to do is just cover ourselves by simply saying, there may be a quorum of members present at this discussion, and, and, and we're good. And so general counsel will, will work those opportunities, and we try to bring that to the fore. Um, so I've got closing comments before uh, you guys go to lunch, so I want to jump on those very quickly. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the kind words about uh, the team. We have a bunch of professionals here. Uh, the TFFA folks have heard me say this before. 
I think sometimes people think that doing public service is a third class job and, and that um, you fall into because there's nothing else you can do. Uh, I know it's different. My dad served in the Air Force. Public service is, is an honor and it's a right and it's a privilege. And to have people that are committed to doing it well and adding you to our family of public servants means a whole lot to us. Uh, what you do is going to be important. Uh, you're now at the table, the proverbial table. Oh, man, I wish somebody would ask me. Well, we're about to ask you. <laughs> and we're going to ask you and we're going to ask you. This is your opportunity to really think through these issues, uh, walk through what, what are the best practices out there, what are the next practices that can make the administration of these programs better and safer. I want fewer fatalities on the road for motorcycles. We may have to take some risk, some bold statements that go against Texas uh, individualism. Um, we know the helmet is an issue. 51% of the deaths could be avoided if there was a helmet in there. We've got to have that brave conversation about what do we do to make the road safer for our motorcyclists, prevent those deaths. Um, Karen puts the number of fatalities on my wall every day, every morning, because I want to be reminded of how important it is that I have something to do. I have a responsibility. I have some opportunity to impact that. I want you to carry that same burden with you. When you get to an advisory board meeting on motorcycle safety, I want you to have the burden of, are we doing it something to make the road safer? Are we doing something to make the road safer for that brand new motorcycle license holder? Are we doing it to make the road safer? Uh, the rules, learn them, live them, love them. Uh, those references that Derek gave you, the more you can become a student on the rulemaking process, the more effective you're going to be as an advisory board member. You already know what you know from your life experiences. Now you have to learn how to apply those life experiences and those work experiences to this rulemaking process. Just like we have to be students on what you do and how you do it so we can be better stewards of what the, uh, the, the state expects us to do, the same is true for you. You know what you know. Now you need to add the rulemaking to what you know so you can be better at delivering that service. You're an important part of this puzzle. Uh, you're the missing piece uh, for, for the fuel industry. You guys haven't had this opportunity before. You haven't been able to, to sit down, roll up your sleeves, and craft what's best for your industry. You haven't been able to be at the table. You're here now. Make the most of that moment. Seek out the input of your friends and your competitors. Bring them to the dialogue. You have an opportunity with a live microphone in front of you. <laughs> Take advantage of it. Take advantage of this opportunity. The other thing I want to talk about is the way we are doing, and this is for my motor fuels folks, the way we do, we're doing your meetings, and generally for the advisory board meetings, we don't have to do it this way. We literally could have all of our meetings in secret. TDLR and our philosophy is to make it transparent. We elevate these meetings with the public postings. We elevate these meetings by having the Roberts Rules of Orders. We elevate these meetings to make sure that the world knows that what's going to impact them, that comes out of these discussions, they can listen to. Um, oh my God, the worst thing, Brad Schulte, is when you are on, like me, because I'm freestyling now. Well, I freestyle all the time in my conversations. You have people that bring up stuff from 2014. Brian, on 2014 in, in October at a meeting, I watched the archive of it. Well, not, number one, you need to get a life. <laughs> Quit watching me on archive. <laughs> number two, thank you for holding me accountable to the words I said. Hold us accountable in this process. That's what the real audio is. That's what the live streaming is. It's about accountability. One of our main core values, this process is about accountability. I want to thank each of you for taking time to be here this morning. It's a lot. I know Ray and everybody was coined the phrase of, you know, uh, you know getting the, through the fire hose or fire faucet. It's a lot, Hydrant. It's a lot. It's a lot to take on. Uh, you're going to be in this game with us for a while. You're going to be with us a while, but we wanted you to have a, a, an understanding of how we do business. We wanted uh, the comments for, that Mr. Webster made to be very clear that we are professionals and we take our job serious. And we're going to bring that to your industry every time you deal with us. You're going to have high level of customer service. You're going to have competence. You're going to have people that care about what they do. And if they don't, you let us know. Thank you for commenting on the, uh, the binders. Uh, Delia, oh, she left. Delia uh, is going to be the one that provides the direct services to, to your advisory boards. Um, 
She takes care of you. Uh, you're going to have a question. There she is, Delia. Thank you so much for all the work you've How many, how many advisory boards do you provide services to? I myself 11. 11. So, see, so you're not the only one, but you've kind of felt like you were you're like, man, she just has us to deal with. She has 11 advisory boards. Uh, she provides that same level of contact. You will have a question inevitably for general counsel, and you'll have one for licensing, and you're like, okay, oh, I don't remember the licensing person's name, and who was the guy, Ray, or was it Trey? I can't remember. Just remember Delia. That, that's, that's who you need to go. And she's going to get your information to the person that needs to get it, and she's going to give you the information back. Yes, you can call 3306, you know, the general counsel number, but if you get a Delia, she's not only going to get it to them, but when they don't get back to you, she's going to get on them. So she, she is, she's your lifeline to the agency. Her and Mary Winston are going to be the folks that you're going to be able to carry your burdens to, carry your concerns to, carry your expectations to as you move through this process. Um, TDLR cannot thank you enough for the service that you're about to provide to us. I can't thank you enough for being here this morning. Uh, David, is he in the room? David, is there anything else I need to say before uh, we dismiss the church? <laughs> oh, wait, we forgot to do the building fund collection. <laughs> Except, uh, just to say, again, thank you, and make sure to be here back timely. Uh, it is hard to find... Uh, an untrafficked area in Austin, so get your lunch. Be back here about 1.15, uh, so we can start one, promptly at 1.30. Thank you very much. Adjourned for now. <laughs> <laughs>